Good evening. The Peoria City Council special meeting will come to order for, for um, February 6, 2018. Uh, this is a study session. We have one item on the agenda for study session this evening. It is Economic Development Market Trends and Development Opportunities Update. City Manager. Great, thank you, Mayor and Council. Really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you uh, today. If it's all right, I'm gonna actually have uh, a few opening comments and then I'll pass it over to Scott and Chris to go through the discussion, which this discussion is really a continuation of the, the conversations we had before the holidays. And you may recall when Andy and Chris talked with our growth trends and focused on property that was ripe for development and ripe for redevelopment as well. And we talked quite a bit about the, the need for looking at those specific land uses that are designated, what are the infrastructure needs there, and what is the service delivery impacts. But another important element that we had talked about that we wanted to tee up for today was to focus when we look at growth, it is also to look at our long-term economic condition. And you may recall, we might have on the next slide, it, it shows when we had our council strategic session last November, we had a real thoughtful discussion about when we talk about economic development, it's really broader than that because the, the critical essential service and role that we have is our long-term economic prosperity. It is to ensure that we have the businesses and our residents have the activity that we can have a vibrant workforce, that you have a diversity of business, you have access to jobs, and this is really more of the discussion about that. Um, sometimes when we talk about economic development or we talk about long-term planning, it's very abstract. But uh, in reality, the decisions that we make today and the conversations that we have today will affect many of the goals and vision that, that you have talked about uh, with us recently. Uh, a case in point is land. So much of the conversation that we'll have today uh, will be about strategic parcels that we have throughout the city. And so for one thing, as Chris so eloquently puts, we are a ground zero for residential development and have been for a number of years. It's a prime destination, uh, looking at yet another plus 1,000 residential units. And it also means that there's commercial growth that would develop around those homes. But what's important about that is what kind of commercial growth? The natural market trends or pressure would be more towards retail development that services those immediate homes in there. But that might not be necessarily what is our long-term goal of trying to ensure that we bring advanced industry that brings the types of jobs that will ensure that Peorians have access to that type of long-term uh, economic wealth. Uh, that we have some is more of an advanced industry job generator. Another aspect that is important and why this discussion today, we talk a lot in our discussions about the importance of place, about creating some great urban places that really creates an experience, that creates a sense of identity for us as Peorians, um, and also, quite frankly, that can attract some of that workforce that we talk about and retain some of the talent pipeline we have here in the city. But to do something like that requires commitment and consistency in the way we look at things. That's a lot of what we're teeing up today because a lot of the discussions, when we look at uh, all of that we have, all the ingredients that we have here in Peoria, we have amazing ingredients to do amazing things in the future. We have financial sustainability. We have a great quality of life. We have a, a, a workforce that is continuing to grow and educate. Uh, and as we talked about in our last a, a session, we have a spirit of entrepreneurship and innovation as well. Um, but what some of the things that we are looking for is land. You know, a, a case in point is the land that we had had uh, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and the land use decisions that we made are affecting us now, today. And Scott's going to be able to talk a little bit about that, a little bit about what we're seeing recently in the last few years has been some of the important business locates in the Phoenix metropolitan area and where we stand in relation to that. But the thing that is important about that is not to get pessimistic about that. That is just a moment in time. The whole idea is that we position ourselves effectively uh, to ensure that we are successful going forward. So with that, I'll pass it over to Scott, but the idea is here, again, we'd love for your conversations as we go through this. Of course, we tend to have canned presentations, but really, we'd love for you to feel free to intervene and react as you feel needed. So I'll pass it over to Scott. Great. Thank you. And great to be before you tonight. 
In terms of the beginning of this presentation, um, you know, of course, our EDIS, Economic Development Implementation Strategy, focuses on the attraction of targeted industries. Um, and so what are examples of that? Uh, examples of our uh, targeted industries includes advanced business services. Um, it includes um, higher education, like Huntington University. It includes advanced manufacturing, like Ma Maxwell Technologies. It includes healthcare, like Honor Health um, in Northern Peoria, Cigna in, in Central Peoria, and most recently, Maricopa Integrated Health Systems in Southern Peoria. Uh, it also includes software development, like Aviage, um, and information technology. These are the types of uh, uh, targeted industries, are also called advanced industries, that in the EDIS process we recognized that we wanted is because of higher wages, typically higher educational attainment profiles for positions offered, and that these are growth industries, uh, industries that are less susceptible to downturn and economic declines. Um, and even though that's the focus of the EDIS and we pay a lot of attention to that, we also know that we have to have a balanced community. Um, so we've assisted uh, in terms of uh, standard manufacturing locates such as Novembal, um, such as Apex Tactical, such as uh, uh, other uh, manufacturers that are considered standard manufacturers uh, because we know that we need to have a balance of job offerings for our residents. But the main focus that we have uh, is on targeted industries for the stated reasons. Now, one of the things I think is really interesting about 2017 is that we had some marquee uh, opportunities. We, we scored well uh, in terms of market validation um, in three key areas. So um, you know the, some of these project names for, as different. I changed them just because they're ongoing processes that are under a non-disclosure agreement. Um, but we, in terms of a national site selection process, were a finalist um, for a very large advanced manufacturing operation in our Vistancia Commercial Corps. And just to give you a sense of the magnitude of that, that was looking for a 300-acre execution uh, for a build to suit advanced manufacturing facility with an initial phase of 500,000 square feet and 2,500 jobs, and at build out, 3 million square feet and 5,000 jobs. Um, we are the only site in the state of Arizona, uh, and one of two nationally. Um, that's never happened before in the history of Peoria. Um, in the same year, our project P83, which you'll know it as a different name, uh, was a large advanced business services uh, entity um, that was looking for up to 300,000 square feet of office uh, for a build to suit 2,500 jobs uh, in the, in the uh, advanced uh, business services space. Uh, that has never happened in the history of the city of Peoria. Um, national uh, site selection finalist uh, and um, the only site in the West Valley. Um, Maricopa Integrated Health uh, Systems, their, their actual locate that we all just celebrated recently. That all happening is to me market validation that the path we've been on, the pat patient strategy, is starting to pay off. People are seeing us differently. People are starting to see the West Valley differently with the recent locate of, of Nicole Automotive as advanced manufacturer. That's important for the West Valley because our objectives we require the West Valley to be viewed differently, not just Peoria, but the West Valley, because workforce is, is a regional issue, and perception is a regional issue. So I, I'm really excited from, about these, these, uh, th this market validation because I think it, it shows that, that we, we got it right and that now we just need to pursue even harder. Now, having said that, we, we have some challenges and, and these aren't new. We've known about these for a long time, but sometimes it just is important to, to uh, refresh our memories. In terms of sites, uh, we're gonna break this down in terms of sites and spaces. So sites are, are, are vacant, um, hopefully shovel-ready sites, so these would be buildable sites, hopefully. Size, size is an issue for us. Jeff mentioned that certain uh, land use decisions in the past uh, have, have had residential consume what could have been industrial or, or commercial space. Um, it is what it is, but when it comes to office sites, our largest buildable site right now is 17 acres, and that's not big. When you look at other comparable sites in other markets, it's quite small, but we have some strengths to counter, counterbalance that, and I think going back to um, my term Project P83, that's validation, that in fact, we can execute given small parcel sizes 
if we do the work to reduce development risk up front. So size is an issue, and in terms of industrial, it's even smaller, is if you take the Vistancia Commercial Corps out of the equation, uh, we don't really have a sizable industrial parcel that's shovel ready. We have it zoned industrial, but it's not shovel ready. So that's a challenge. Rail service, for those industries that require proximity to rail, we don't have that. Um, distance from the I-10, this is an issue for industrial, when, and we're gonna see some heat maps a little later on, and it'll be overwhelming, the amount of activity um, that's around the 10. And there's no big surprise there. A lot of the industrial locations there are because of the truck drive distance to the ports of Los Angeles and uh, Long Beach. Uh, they wanna be as close as possible for turnaround times. Amenities and placemaking, and this is largely an issue for office. Office users today, uh, they, they, they like to have a well-established amenity package and well-established walking distance to restaurants and entertainment and placemaking. That, that is very important. Um, and we have some sites where that's well-placed and, and, and available, and, and so we score well on that. Not all of our sites are currently in that station. Um, so that's something that we just gotta be aware of, and what can we do to change that reality? Surrounding development also sometimes becomes a challenge uh, where you have a site that you know, has um, existing residential. Um, you know, we, we've gotta be mindful of height. We've gotta be mindful of scale, massing. Um, and sometimes that can, that can influence what is um, a market response to it. And please feel free to, to stop me at any time for, for questions. So as we look now at spaces, so the, now we're talking about existing spaces. Um, size is an issue. Our largest contiguous industrial existing space is 40,000 square feet. And as we'll see later on in some slides, the market's way north of that. Um, when you look at office, our largest contiguous office space is 20,000 square feet. And as we'll see later on, the market is, is considerably uh, higher than that as well for a lot of locates. Surrounding development for spaces is also an issue just as with sites. You know, if it's, if it's an existing office building and it's completely separate from walkable amenities, that's an issue in terms of what other competition uh, has available. The type of space, specifically Class A office space, is an issue because we don't have any. Um, so that's something that becomes a bit of a headwind for us. And existing buildings with modern spaces. Well, what does modern spaces mean? You know, the, the advanced industries today aren't looking for your low ceiling height sea of cubicle space. High ceiling heights, you know, collaboration spaces, and something that's more interactive. That's what a lot of the advanced industries are looking for these days. Um, so even though we might have product, the question is, is the product of the type and, and scale and um, design that, that the market wants to be? But the strengths, I think, are just as clear and workforce, and this is probably the first time you've ever heard me say that, because before the conversation always was, wow, we have a real issue with workforce. And I really have to acknowledge the work that has been done by West Valley Cities, by MAG, by Westmark, by a whole host of entities that have been part of the workforce development implementation strategy effort that's been going on for, gosh, what, a year and a half now? And the, the number one thing out of the gate we knew we needed to do was deal with workforce data. And so we, we've, we've, we've found uh, third-party data that shows our competitiveness. Um, it's referred to as EMSI data. We, we, we pay for it, um, but it has made a big difference, a big, big difference. So we're really excited about that. So now, is it perfect? No, but it's a heck of a lot better than we've ever had before. Um, and so, you know, workforce, now we can prove it, and that was always the issue before. Quality schools, we know. Infrastructure and lifestyle, we know. But another strength, and, and again, I'll, I'll go back to um, the, the advanced manufacturer for Vistancia and, and the advanced business service uh, user for P83, um, is our ability to do the work to um, eliminate pre-development risk, to create development program creation, and to do the site due diligence work. That makes a big difference. Um, if you're eliminating risk, you're improving your odds of investment. And, and those are things that I think those two recent locates, including MIHS, show uh, matters. Excuse me, Scott, before you move on from that slide, can you just dig a little bit deeper and explain further what 
kinds of proactive and aggressive approaches you take? What are, what are the things that you do to minimize pre-development, um, minimize the risk for a developer? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, this would be, now every site's different. Every site has a different station condition. So these are just examples of things that could be necessary. It could be everything from an ALTA survey, which is a survey of property boundaries, the identification of easements, things in the land that if, if too many encumbrances are in place, uh, it could be too much for somebody to want to take on. Um, market study for um, proposed uses. Uh, broker analysis on targeted business attraction potential to a site. This all speaks to the market ability for a site to attract the users that are desired. Um, site planning, traffic studies, infrastructure and utility analysis for the proposed site, uh, feasibility studies, zoning analysis to determine is the right zoning in place, um, coordination with the property owner, um, and completion of a complete due diligence package including workforce analysis. So if we are doing those things and we can prove a business case that you can be successful here and here's the execution, then you've taken a lot of development risk, pre-development risk, and turned it into a positive. Instead of saying, that's too scary for me, I have other opportunities elsewhere, hmm, that's interesting, tell me more. And that's what I mean. And then when we did that for Peoria Place, it worked. When we did that for P83, it worked. When we did that in the Visatia Commercial Corps, working with Stratford Land, it worked. So that gives me some sense that we're kind of onto something here. And that is work that we can do. Mayor, I'm so glad that was the, the perfect lead in to a lot of what the conversation is, which is once we kind of lay out this, this kind of environmental scam, is to go in those very specific land pieces and talk about those instances, what are the specific studies and, and analysis that needs to be done, and kind of the efforts we're going to be doing this year to do, make that a reality. So we'll show you that shortly. And in addition to that stuff, you have all of the, the workforce data so you can show um, where the workforce mm -hmm the kind of workforce that is within a certain shed Absolutely. drive zone? Yeah, okay. it's, on our, it's on our website right now. Yeah. We, we, we actually pinpoint intersections and we have a complete labor analysis. Yeah, so these are all the things that we can do. And it's the perfect segue into this next slide. This is exactly what I'm talking about. You know, when, we, when I say a, a full, you know, deep dive, you know, it's everything from site control, working with the property owners, you know, because if you can't control the site, well, nothing's really gonna happen, right? Market risk. Every developer doesn't want to take market risk. Well, if we can show that we can generate the, the tenant base um, that's, that they're looking for, then that's one less thing they got to do. Entitlement risk. That's a big thing. Can I get the zoning? If I have the zoning, is it a permitted use? Is it conditional use? I don't like conditional use. I want a permitted use. If those are all things we can work out, working collaboratively, that's one less thing on the developer's checklist. You know, site planning and technical studies. Those are all things we can do to reduce the time frame for implementation because speed to market matters and time is money. That's where the developer is at. And if we can positively affect change in that regard, then I think we have a different dialogue. So let's understand what's going on in the market. This is the part where most people go, oh, really, do we have to talk about this? But it is kind of important to understand the regional dynamics, what's going on. Um, so we won't spend a whole lot of time on it, but I think it's important. So this is a slide, um, and we get our data from Lee and Associates. Uh, they, they, they issue quarterly uh, reports on, on market transactions and activities. The, the thing that I think is important here in terms of um, top office leases, you know, what are the, 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 the large lease takedowns that are occurring in the Valley? Um, and, and so this is broken out by uh, user, by class of space, um, but what's important is to understand where is that occurring? And probably no big surprise, right? It's, it's Phoenix and East Valley. Um, but when you look at the square footage size and you take into account our largest existing is 20,000, you know, that tells you our future is in new development. And that's what the EDIS2 said and its very first goal is that you got to create more product on the industrial side and on the office side. And so that's what we've been working towards. So we just got to continue that. Now, what this is showing, so the first one was leases. This is new construction, all right? So this is breaking it out by BTS, which stands for build to suit, meaning that the tenant is secured and now they're gonna construct versus spec or speculative, which means that you don't have your tenants um, uh, already, already signed up. 
Now, spec development is the greatest, con you have to have the greatest amount of confidence in a market to, to go spec because you don't have anybody signed up or very few tenants at that point. Yeah, I think the important takeaways from this slide is look at the amount of spec that's going on in the East Valley and in, in, in the Phoenix area. Um, built a suit is great, everybody wants that, uh, but you know, look at the square footages, they're big. Um, the spec, that's the ultimate sign of confidence in a submarket. Um, so if we were to filter this by our space availability, assuming it was looking for existing space, it would be that. So this is a challenge. We've known it, we just need to work harder. Now, this slide is showing us GPEC prospect act office activity. So prospect, that means somebody that's shopping the valley. As compared to a locate, that means they actually decide to locate here. So when you break it out, what's important, I think, on this slide is look at the, ex the percent of locates by year that want existing space. Consistently in the 80s, you know, ending in the high 80s. And look at the average square footage. So the left side of this slide is talking about prospects. The right side of it is looking at locates, those that actually decide to locate. I think an interesting number is the total prospects to total locates. That's not a big number. Um, and then when you look at the average square footage of office locates, it's more than we have. But then if you look, because it's average, right? So then you look at the, the locates that would be 20,000 or less in terms of what we have to offer, and there's some. But again, it speaks to, it's not just about size, it's about condition, design, is it class B, is it class C, and where, where the, where's the amenity package? You know, so these are all things that matter. So I think you know, what's important to know is that you know, if, if we don't, again, add the product, the inventory, it's difficult to compete. Industrial activity, same, same logic. The only thing that's additional here is when you look at the average acreage for an industrial build to suit. It's high acreage. The only acreage we have that's shovel ready with maybe the Vistantia Commercial Corps. That's why we saw that large advanced manufacturer very interested in the only site in Arizona. Now, do we have some locates uh, that were uh, at 40,000 or less? Yes, but it's, it's uh, you know, a small percentage, but we always go after them. But again, it comes down to the condition of the space, the location of the space, um, and oftentimes an industrial power and water. So as I mentioned, we also look at um, you know, uh, standard manufacturing. So we, we've, GPAC came in at 12,005 feet, Novembal came in at 63, um, and Apex Tactical came in at 50, because those were spaces we had available. Now we have very, very low industrial vacancy. So there's an opportunity now to get new build. Low vacancy, high demand, new build. This I think is an interesting slide. The uh, yellow is office, the red is industrial. You see the airports, you see ASU campus locations. Um, this is locates from July of 15 through November of 17. And that whole I-10, and we're gonna see it also on an upcoming heat map, that's where the industrial activity in large part. Now, now this is just GPEC assisted locates. So if it was a locate that didn't go through GPEC, then it's off this chart. So for example, you don't see Honor Health there. That didn't come through GPEC. You don't see Cigna there. That didn't come through GPEC. You didn't see MIHS there. That didn't come through GPEC. Um, Maxwell, you don't see just because that came before um, July of, of 15. But the headline is the clustering of office in downtown um, Phoenix, Camelback Corridor, Tempe, South, uh, Southeast uh, Valley and industrial on the, uh, the I-10 for the stated reasons of being close to the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach. It's also interesting to see the clustering of activity around ASU campuses with the exception of ASU West. Now, that, that is an asset that perhaps has opportunity for the future. Now, I find this an interesting Class A office heat map. So again, it's just reinforcing what we've seen. 
you know, where is the intensity of activity? The thing that is interesting to me, though, and gives me confidence that we have an execution coming our way, is if you look at this map here, and if you look at the 17 just north of Loop 101, you'll see two very significant insurance locates there. One was USAA initially at 700 employees and one at Farmers Insurance at 700 employees. And they made the leap from the East Valley to the, Northwest, to the North Valley. How much of an effort might it be to get it then to hop just one more step on over to our P83? I think it's there, especially now that we have our workforce data and we have one that has already put us in the, in, in the top three. So that gives me confidence that that can happen. Office absorption heat map. So again, no, no big surprises there. The only difference here is that this is all classes of office, so A, B, and C. Um, so again, if you look at that same area, just on the 17 north of the 101, where USAA and Farmers is, that was a significant footprint of office activity. Um, so I think that we have a real shot, especially since USAA now is hiring a significant number of new employees. That shows it can work outside of the East Valley. Industrial absorption, again, showing along the I-10. But you see this one just on the west side of, of the Loop 303. Catches your eyes, like, whoa, what's going on there? That's that, that Con Air um, appliance uh, manufacturing. It was a, a, a space absorption. So those are the trends. So given the trends, given the strengths, given some of the, the headwinds, what do we see going forward? Um, well, in terms of key sites, I, I think to me these are the, the three, uh, the four things that are important. Protecting. We have a handful of high value targets in terms of development sites that we're going to talk about and see. I think it's important that we protect them as much as we can from being just the same old, same old and giving ourselves a chance to be successful in attracting these, these new opportunities. Reimagining. I think we have to look uh, at our, our retail executions, uh, our mixed use executions. Can it be different? You know, do we, do we have to have status quo development or can it be reimagined into something else? And then the repositioning of it through the due diligence work and the deep dive on the pre-development risk elimination uh, for de-risking. Um, and I think these are the things that are gonna be necessary going forward so that these, those key sites um, aren't lost to something that we don't want. So Peoria Place is a great example. You know, this is an exhibit that came out of our due diligence package that we put together. And um, you know, right now, the property owner is in discussions with us, planning about doing a PAD amendment to put the zoning in conformance with this and with some tweaks. That's a powerful step, right? That's one less thing the developer of, of, of adjoining uses needs to worry about. Uh, so we, we would want to do a deeper dive also in terms of proving up that this execution can work, that the zoning is there, that the tenants can be attracted. In fact, I'm, I'm getting calls right now that, you know, hey, if you need help attracting anyone that could be a user benefiting from the activity of MIHS. So, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a conversation we've wanted to have for a long time. Well, <clears throat> I thought this was already zoned. Isn't that why it says business center and high density residential? Is it already zoned for those or are those just suggestions? See, what, what happened is um, this property, as we all know, sat idle for a long, long time in, in the property owner's portfolio. Um, and until we presented this package to them, they weren't motivated really to do much of anything. When we showed that MIHS could come in and actually buy land and execute, um, the zoning reflects the old Elman uh, project. That's what I thought. Yeah. So now this is a completely different construct. And okay, so the so zoning doesn't support this now. Okay. This, this is not the old Elman. No. Okay because this is, this is good. I couldn't remember. I knew it was essentially kind of the same because they were going to have a dormitory and we're going to have those high-density residentials. But so, um, so this is rezoned this way or this is what you're recommending? This is the site plan we've recommended. Um, right now the property owner is talking with planning about a PAD amendment to make the zoning comport more with this. Now as part of that process, they might say, well, you know what, you know, we think high density residential should be different. You know, th so there'll be some modifications to it because okay. this was really, this is really to show 
that this can happen, this can work, that this can, this can be executed. But the PAD amendment then will drive what the property owner really thinks this can and should be. What does PAD mean? Planned area development. It's a specific and customized zoning. Oh, you're saying P, PAD. You're saying PAD. I thought you were saying P80. Oh, no, PAD. Right. Council Member Hunt, so the PAD is planned area development, and right. we have okay. a number of them throughout the city. They're all different. Right. They're all customized. So a um, site plan like this would have to go through a, a rezone process, a new PAD, which would right. be a public process. Does each one of these have to go through a process, or do you do it as a clump? Councilor Hump, I would imagine that that a that a PAD would, would would look at the balance of the property outside of the of the MIHS facility and take it forward as one PAD. Okay. So the question is, you know, what we've proposed here, um, you know, is, is the mixed use, multi-phase build out, you know, with healthcare, business office, light industrial, retail, retail and housing. What do you guys think about that? Does that sound right? Are there certain uses in there that you think, eh, it doesn't sound quite right? Maybe something that's not there at all that should be included? Um, that would be great feedback. As, as I mentioned, we're starting the conversation with the property owner about a PAD amendment. Um, so I, I'd love to hear what your thoughts are on that. I have a question. Um, have we had some interest since MIHS has, has announced here? Have we had some interest from um, medical centers or medical offices or any, anyone else? No, not yet. I think, I think what we need to do is get the PAD amendment done first because one of the first questions is what's the zoning? So if we can, if we can address that issue and, and show through, again, some more due diligence work because this package that we put together here was really for sales and marketing purposes. Mm -hmm. Now one needs to be developed for development purposes. Um, so that would be more work to be done. Uh, but I, I really think that it strengthens our position to have those conversations when the zoning's in place. Okay. Council Member Hunt, do you have any comments on that? No, I, I had looked at this the other day. I guess I must have gotten it over there somewhere. I don't remember where, but I had looked at this, and um, I actually thought it was the Elman plan because it, it's really very close to that. And uh, no, I, I like what I see. Obviously, at that time, we were talking about a university instead of uh, uh, a hospital or a medical center. But no, I, I like this. I think this is good. And we put the medium density residential back against other residential. So I, I think this is smart. Now, the reason we included a business center is because I mentioned we are very low on, on industrial vacancy. And so if we can get any industrial, it helps us a lot in attracting standard manufacturing and advanced manufacturing. Um, and so that's, that's why we have um, business in there as well as industrial. The, the only other thing, and this is, would take this completely and throw it out, is um, is there any interest in seeking a branch of, say, Grand Canyon University to come in here and sit side by side with this medical facility because they're really strong on training medical. Uh, have we explored that? Would that just mess this whole thing up? Or No, I think that, I think that could be a very uh, synergistic use. Um, and that's kind of the feedback that I think is, is important because you know, when we interface, when, when planning interfaces you know, with, with uh, the property owner on the PAD amendment, you know, we want to make sure that then we include that as a, as a use. Well, I, I think so because, and I'm sure you know this better than anyone, but they backed out of looking at Mesa or wherever they were going in the East Valley, so they're probably looking for uh, some land right now. So yeah. yep. I've always wanted a university there. <laughs> I really love the medical center, but I'd really like to bring a university there. Okay. So if we can look, look at that, yeah. have that at the top of the, the thinking. Good. So if we, if we decide to, to zone this as a PAD, does it really have to be this uh, delineated? Can we just say the entire area from this street to this street is that, and here's the uses that are allowable in there? I, I they don't so. have to be light industrial over here and residential over here. Mayor Is Council, uh, we can build as much flexibility as we desire into the PAD. So if we want to establish pockets of land use or have a, a conceptual uh, land plan, we certainly have the ability to do refinements as the site plan comes in later on. Yeah, I think that sounds like the most flexible idea, just listing them as, as text, what yeah. we would 
allow in there. And that would include then uh, anything from medical to industrial to education. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, flexibility is going to be the key because, again, this is a multi-year build-out. And, you know, users always want flexibility. Yeah. Any other comments? No. Nope. Great. Thank you for that. Now, uh, this is our, our P83 site, and this is just a prior concept that is included for really just discussion purposes. Um, so the thing that I think is important to, to have a conversation about on this is this site is a great opportunity to bring density, to bring high-profile office development. Of course, there's a relationship between amount of square footage and required parking. So this is parked, and it needs to be parked at five to one, meaning five spaces for every thousand square feet, because that's what those types of tenants require, at a minimum, quite frankly. Some of them in other places go as high as you know, five and a half, six to one. But five, five to one is what we're at. So we have an opportunity for a 10-story tower. We have an opportunity for up to 270, 280,000 square feet. That's, that's a nice size footprint right there. That's gonna be the tallest building in the West Valley. That's going to be iconic. Um, I personally think that that tip is where you want the density. It's away from the stadium. It's away from the, the, the clubhouses. But you do have the need to park it. So we have you know, this, this construct, um, and we're, we're actually modifying this right now, you know, is, is um, six levels above grade. And you know, we've had conversations in the past about you know, where that should be. And, and I don't think probably a long 83rd is where you want it. So when you start to look at the site being small, when you start to look at the opportunity for density, when you start looking at where should those pieces of the puzzle fit, it's fairly prescribed. Um, now, if we wanted to have less parking structure, we would need to have less square footage, and that's fine too. The only thing I would say is when you average out the amount of square footage that build to suit developments are going on right now, it's about 220,000. So you probably don't want to be south of that. But we kind of sized it at 270, 280 as being optimal. Um, but the feedback that I think would be helpful is, are we OK with significant density um, on the tip there at, at, at Mariners and, and 83rd um, as, as we have in the past? Um, understanding that that amount of square footage drives the parking, thus enabling and needing parking structures to the tune of six, seven levels. Um, and then what's not shown here, but is definitely part of the conversation, is specialty retail and restaurant opportunities along 83rd. Um, because we want to branch out into those areas, and so we have to have places for it to be. Um, so I just, so just some thoughts. I mean, we could do a lower density execution where you have more smaller buildings, but then the, the trade-off is not having the iconic large presence. Um, so it's really just kind of getting a sense of, of what do you guys think about that? Density, no density, smaller scale, larger scale, and requisite parking. So, council, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I like the idea, I like the, the higher density. It makes sense as, as the area is growing, the restaurants are there, they're needing the clientele to occupy those locations to feed into their business, into their restaurants, and so this makes perfect sense. And though I'm not 100% okay with the six-story parking, I know that it's absolutely necessary to feed, you know, to, it's a, the lesser two evils, I'd rather have it all there um, and have the parking amenities and everything else. So it's not the ideal for me, but it makes perfect sense for that location. So I, I, I like this. So, um in this plan, are you including some gathering pedestrian areas between these buildings? Yeah, so the, as I mentioned, we're, we're currently doing a whole different construct on this. And the, the only differ, the difference is being is the addition of um, retail restaurant uh, pads along 83rd, because that's where those want to be. Um, and the creation of public gathering areas. So one that would be actually in the courtyard area uh, of, of the, uh, the office, connecting to the Z crossing. Uh, we're also looking at some concepts for expanded 
uh, plaza area um, in front of the stadium itself. So for tailgating, for special events um, that are shaded and landscaped and themed and, and, and then a pedestrian connectivity between the two running along the um, face of the uh, parking garage. So yes, where are those opportunities for inviting, engaging, gathering places, public spaces um, that can be incorporated in here? So yes, we are. We are. Another question. Okay, go ahead. Sure. So would this include, I know at one time we had talked about um, somehow tying it to this con creek trail system as well. So would that have accessibility so that when these businesses come in there and those um, tenants are wanting to do things on their lunch hours, not only could they go and eat at the restaurants, but they could partake in the trail systems that Peoria has to offer. I think it's essential because, yeah. you know, I mean, that's a great amenity package yeah. inclusion for walking or bike riding or getting your lunchtime jog in. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I love the idea of tying it into Skunk Creek. I think that's a great idea. Um, also, I know that you mentioned here that um, uh, the Z crossing, mm -hmm. is that, and I too like the idea of high density here um, and all of this office space, but I think part of what is really essential to encouraging the success for all of the success for all of these businesses is accessibility and people being able to get from activities on one side of 83rd Avenue to the other. Um, and I see the Z crossing as serving the need for today, but do you envision that there would be a pedestrian bridge or some way um, to accommodate more activity and get people safely across the street from one side to the other? Yeah, uh, I, I, I don't see why not. Um, it'll just be a question of where's, where are the connection points um, and, and funding. Funding, always funding. 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 funding, yeah. I, so I envision the road being depressed there, and it all being pedestrian, walking back and forth across. <laughs> there. And so along those lines, um, are you going to be putting together some kind of uh, some kind of a video, like you did with Amazon, mm -hmm. or something to really bring this to life? Yes, yes, we're working on that right now. So we are, um, and you know. The, the final product will be a, a video of the whole P83 area, including the activities of the, of the sports complex with an embedded site plan, animated, activated. So it, it, it would, it's like the Amazon video plus one. Um, and so we're gonna use that as, as one of our principal sales and marketing tools. Um, but I think what also makes sense then is to do a deeper dive on the due diligence side towards development, meaning construction pro formas, what's the cost per square foot going to be, what's the common area maintenance charge going to be, all the things that people are going to ask. So that we have the great sales and marketing tool that we're working on and should be wrapping up in the I don't know, next three or four weeks. And then the, 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 the detailed analysis in front of a, a prospect or a developer or a build a suit would be able to answer those questions too. Scott, maybe you wouldn't mind mentioning also how, um, with regard to business and marketing, once you do have those products, how are you looking out to market to some of those selected areas? Maybe a little bit about that. Yeah, so we've had a couple models that we've used in the past. And um, the common denominator bottom line is nothing happens without a tenant. So we're looking at a different way of sales and marketing, meaning that we're going to go direct to the brokerage houses. So the brokerage houses in the valley, the brokerage houses that are in um, other high cost areas where they might have large tenant lease rollovers coming up. We don't want to go, certainly we'll go through our partners as well, but we know that if, if there's a, a, a field broker in Orange County that knows of a large tenant rollover and they want a cost savings, we want to go and we want to present directly to that broker and that brokerage house. We want to be part of their sales meetings. So it's, it's getting directly connected to those that know the deals as opposed to being one step removed. Uh, so I think we got to be aggressive that way. I think we have to kind of forge our way into that world. Um, we certainly want to continue working with our partners, um, but we got to get the tenants. That's the bottom line. You know, I, I, a developer will always want to tie up the site. Mm -hmm. And if they don't deliver, then we've just tied up the site. 
if we go get a tenant that's ready to enroll, like that prospect was for P83, then we control more of our own destiny, I believe. Good. Thank you. Core West. This is really just a, a reminder. Um, Core West, this is currently with the Plaza Companies, and they're engaged in sales and marketing right now. Um, this is a Class B office execution um, uh, on our 14-acre site, uh, Peoria and 101. Um, so sales and marketing activity is still going on. You know, we're, we're, we're working with them to try and find some, some tenants. Again, this is a, a build to suit. This could be a single user execution, which actually would be great. Um, if it's a multi-user execution, then you know, the question is how, many, how long will it take to get a critical balance of those tenants signed up so that we can actually start construction. Uh, but that's, that's underway. Park West. Uh, this is this is an asset um, that uh, is important. Has uh, you know nice visibility. Has some challenged access. Um, but in talking with the property owners, uh, they are, are pretty interested in multifamily housing. Um, you know we think that uh, there's other opportunities, perhaps for a data center with uh, some associated office, some entertainment, some hotel. Um, so. Again, that might be an opportunity, you know, working collaboratively with the uh, property owner to come up with a mixed-use execution that gives them a little bit of what they're interested in and hopefully a little support for things that we're interested in. But what would be helpful for me is, does that mix of uses sound right to you guys? Multifamily housing, data center with some office. We've been getting a lot of looks, actually, on data center execution. Um, and it can be helpful in terms of attracting some office. Entertainment, we think, could be a use there. Um, hotel, does that sound right? Does it sound like we're missing something? Council? Yes. I'm talking about where the star is. Yes, there's a current vacant 17-acre site. Okay. <clears throat> Multifamily would be apartments, be mm -hmm. multi-story. Correct. It could be renter or owner-occupied. Yeah. Okay, I'm just thinking back to um, the one mistake at... I wasn't on council, but council made when we put housing along the 101. Uh, I think before the 101 was there, maybe. But uh, we said we weren't going to put housing. We weren't going to use that valuable space for housing. But do you consider a multi-housing not in the same category as you would single-family homes there? Mayor, Councilmember Hunt. Um, it, it, there definitely is a distinction between that and single family. And I think for this site, for this, if you look at the balance of the Park West property, it's a, it's a mixed use site. And I think with uh, to, to make a, a mixed use property uh, successful, you need several ingredients. You need not only the retail experiences there, but you need the daytime employment. I think also the residential to complement it. You kind of need all three ingredients to make that work. I think what we're suggesting here on this uh, vacant 17 acre property is perhaps that multifamily could be a component of that, but ultimately I think the larger part of that execution, if I'm, if I'm correct, would be possibly some employment users, entertainment hotel to complement that. Because there already is uh, uh, quite a bit of multifamily on the property or on the, the mixed use area. Yeah, and the other thing to keep in mind, and Chris, correct me if I'm wrong, but they can build multifamily today based on existing zoning. Oh, they're zoned already for that. Yeah, so the question, right? They can, but there's a, there's a yeah. limit on how much multifamily could be on the entire yeah. property. Yep. So, so then, given that, the, the, the hopeful conversation is, okay, what about some other uses, like data center, office, entertainment, hotel, so that we get total cooperation for a mixed-use execution, understanding that their interest is in multifamily, and they can build some already under existing zoning. Most of these businesses, uh, well, I won't say most, but a lot of these have been here since almost the inception of Park West, certainly Harkins and... Uh, the Blue Bur Burger and Grimaldi's and, and a number of those, uh, and some come and go. But I would guess that they could certainly uh, profit from having more people right there to use those services. They're not out of line in terms of cost. They're not high priced. They just seem not to have enough foot traffic there. So I can see that that would be really profitable to put a lot of people there. Yeah, I mean, that's... that's Within that, walking distance. Yeah, you want em employment-generating uses in a mixed-use, horizontal mixed-use execution, vertical mixed-use execution, because, yeah, it, it, it brings daytime mm -hmm. population. And for restaurants that require daytime population, then you're helping them. Go ahead. Sorry, Scott, I have a question. So 
w with the casino that's opening up, and they're obviously you know breaking ground on, on their their new facility. Do you see different use possibilities with this property other than residential or? Well, the multifamily is not my preference, um, but the property owners, that's based on my last conversation with them, where they see the value. And, and they probably can get more value out of that use just based on what the market's generating these days. Um, so, so my interest more is on the uh, hotel entertainment and data center office. Um, but, but, do you, but do you see a hotel thriving there when you've already, you know, when, when a bigger hotel is going to be across the street? Or do you... Or do you see maybe a different industry that kind of somehow caters to the, the gaming industry? Yeah, I, I think more that. You know, I, I, think, I think if there's a hotel play to be made here, I mean, of course, we'd have to do market studies and we'd have to understand what that, really, what that opportunity really is. But, you know, I, I could see where if there's a different execution, a, a boutique hotel, something that offers uh, an experience that's different from what we have, it could possibly work there. But it, it needs to be proven up. Absolutely vetted. Yeah. yeah. So you say you've had some interest from data center users. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Like how large of a, of a building would that be? What are their needs? Yeah, so, so typically data centers don't occupy, uh, well, they can occupy significant space, but they don't generate a lot of employment. So I mean, typically they're higher wage jobs, but they're not a lot of jobs. But what you see sometimes, depending on the executions, you, you see that there are office uh, users that want to locate in proximity to data centers. Not all the time, but sometimes. Um, so we, we, we have had some, some inquiries on, uh, from data centers. A lot of them like the Vistancia Commercial Corps because of all the power, right, because they, they draw a lot of power. With the uh, SRP lines, you know, that seems to make sense to me, that, you know, as a power um, source, it's probably rich. Um, so I think, you know, that could be, that could be viable. Um, the question is how much bolt-on development can it bring? And that we'll have to evaluate. But I think, I think a data center could be interesting. We don't really have many of those facilities in the West Valley. Right, and, and they use a lot of water too, right? And there's abundant water, this is SRP water area mm -hmm. here, right? Water and power is, is, is pretty rich. Mm-hmm, be a good site for a data center. Yeah. Yes, Council Member Hunt. Yeah, I have a lesson 101 question here. Exactly. What does a de data center, I mean, I can imagine what it does, but what would one be doing inside a data center if you were working there? A lot of them are server farms, you know, so I mean, they're, they're hosting humongous data servers, you know, so, you know, data storage. Like what we have over in our IT department, that those big things? Yeah, they kind of like large vaults of servers um, so that they can uh, house the, the data from the, the, the clients that they, they do business with. So they're housing yeah. data. So, so you know, it's, 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 it's not a lot of employees, it's um, but they typically are, are higher than, you know, the standard wages, you know. But so, so the reason why we might be interested in that is, one, don't have many of those facilities in the valley, uh, the west side, I should say. Um, the, the water and power is there. Um, and, uh, you know, if they can bring bolt-on office, and, uh, you know, that might be an interesting execution because the site is challenged on accessibility. You know, so that throws some users right out from the get-go um, because you have to go all the way up 99th and then in. And for some users, that's inconvenient. But maybe for this mix of uses, that could, that could be functional. Oh, Carlo? Yes, yeah, Scott, I read a, a while back that Park West was for sale. Is it still for sale? Uh, it, well, it was for sale by Howard Hughes. Um, let's see, Howard Hughes Corporation and Sire bought it. So they sold it? Yeah, this was a while ago. Yeah. Now, now you're right, now you're sitting down here. I'm going to stop in the bottom up. A hotel. What kind of hotel are you talking about? I don't really know. Um, this is just identifying a proposed use. So, I mean, I think one that would need to stand out from the existing inventory would probably need to be like a boutique hotel, something that offers a little different service, um, maybe a, a, a better uh, restaurant, more of a themed, unique offering, not just another three-star, but something that's more boutique. 
Because, you know, you get plenty of land out there. Uh, Not a lot of vacant lots. Yeah, well, the, the 17 acres has, as you know, with those SRP lines, those are, you can't build under them. So when you net out the acreage under the SRP lines, and then you net out internal circulation, buildable space, it's a, you, you, you have a good footprint there. But, you know, you, it's, it's not like we could fit a, a, a lot in there unless we're going to go vertical. Vertical tends to be more expensive. So these are just some of the things we just got to work out. Now, you talk about entertainment. What kind of entertainment are you talking about? Well, it's going to have to be something, again, that, that is, is, is not represented already in the valley, uh, the west side, I should say. Because, I mean, in, in Westgate, you already have, you know, Dave and Buster's. You already have bowling. You already have, you know, a lot of, of things there. So it, it's going to have to be something that is not represented here already. Um, so what we're going to have to do, if, if you guys say, yeah, that sounds right, is we're going to have to do a deep dive, understand what the brokers see as coming into the, in the west side, that could be a good fit for this. Um, but I, I think it's got to be unique. I think it's got to be something that uh, isn't in the west side already. And between Arrowhead Mall and Westgate, we have to find something that's niche that can work there. Because, you know, I get the... Uh I got a few calls on that, on that sandbar. Well, it's not there no more. The music is loud. Of course, I don't hear it, but some of the people call me up and tell me the music is loud. So I, I don't know what kind of entertainment you're talking about. You know, but like you say, like bowling alleys, stuff like that, that I could see. Yeah. You know. Yeah, um, I think it would have to be a, like a different different angle on bowling, because you already have two bowling establishments in, in Westgate. So we, we just got to find what that niche is and, uh, and, and see if that can execute on this site. So we got to work with the brokers, and you know, we got to understand what's available, what site are they looking for, and, and can this be feasible? Okay, thank you. Can you tell me what can be done to remedy the um, access situation? Uh, in terms of direct access into the 17 acres? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'll take a stab at that, and Chris, feel free to jump in. Um, you know, there was, once upon a time, the discussion of a frontage road that was just way too expensive. Um, so I don't believe um, that there's an opportunity to get access directly into the site off the off-ramp. Um, I don't know, Chris, if you know anything more than that. <laughs> Because what we're left then, while Andy's walking up, is you know literally northern to 99th and then 99th in. Yeah, that seems unreasonable. Yeah. Mayor and Council, right now we're working on the Northern Parkway traffic interchange, and as part of that analysis, we're looking at where we potentially could in the future put it right in, right out for that future development. But right now, if something came in today, we'd have to work with the Arizona Department of Transportation to see if they would allow it. <coughs> they haven't been inclined to do that in the past, but. Uh, with this project going forward, they're, they're, they're working with us on that analysis. I think part of your, um, uh, part of getting the site plan ready for prospective use, you're gonna have to show some kind of possibility for yeah. that. Yeah. And also, I am not in favor of putting residential there in any way. Yeah. <coughs> Good. Yes, council member. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just for clarification, where the big yellow star is, 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 uh, is that because of the, of the difficulty getting in and out? Is that the reason why industrial or, or um, retail is less conducive? And if it is more conducive for um, multifamily housing, is that because the owner wants multifamily housing? Yeah, so my last conversation with the ownership is that they're we had an appraisal done on the property, and based on what the ownership believes they can get uh, with a multi-family execution, that would have to be double appraised value. So that's not something we can do. Um, and so that's, the, that's the, the, the market value of one asset class over another. So that's why, at that time, they were so eager on the multifamily side. So. I get that we don't want multifamily. I mean, I've been fighting multifamily on that site, going all the way back to Stern's Bank. Um, 
we'll just have to see, since they already can get it through existing zoning, how much of a negotiation we can have um, to either exclude it, <coughs> but then there's that value that's left on the table, right? Um, or include some of the uses that we have. That's, that's good. quite frankly going to be the negotiation. You know, if we can get a right in, right out, that adds value. Yeah. So maybe that's part of the conversation. If we, through our efforts, can actually bring these users as opposed to just talk about it, that adds value. So then maybe there's that opportunity. But um, that's where they're at right now. Is here's what that, mark, that multifamily developer will pay. Um, and if we're, if that is more than double appraised value, then we don't look very competitive. As far as industrial, I did bring in industrial brokers to evaluate the site. And one of the concerns they, is too close to residential. Um, so it just kind of blows industrial off entirely. So retail, the whole retail world is exploding uh, and, and being reimagined. Um, and um, I think that issue of having to go all the way to 99th and under power lines in becomes a problem from a retail perspective. Um, so that's why we were kind of left with the asset classes that we have here. And so if there is a list of things that we can do to change the site to be um, more applicable to a preferred use, maybe we can mm -hmm. get that list and then cost it out and see if it's something that we could um, facilitate in our budget or budgets as yeah. time goes on. Yep, exactly. Okay. Good. Yes, Carlo. Don't forget we're down here. <laughs> Try to remember. Uh, I see you getting here in Northern Avenue. Is that still going through? Um, I'll defer to Andy on that. Mayor and Council, yeah, the, the project is still active. Um, right now they're working on phase two, which is to the west of us and uh, enters our jurisdiction on our west boundary limits. Um, this section is um, um, scheduled to be widened in the 2023 to 2025 time frame. So do you have the money for that? Yes, the project has the money for it. You get it. the money for that. Mm -hmm. So in other words, you're not considering the people... This is a fight I've been fighting since 2005. You're not considering the people that live back there. And when, once you open that to four, uh, six lanes, whatever it's going to be, you're going to get more trucks, more diesels, and then all that stuff is going to go over the fence to the people's homes. You can put a 12-foot wall there. A lot of people don't want a 12-foot wall. So, you know, you're not taking into consideration for the people who live there and I get over 300 signatures, but I ain't even gone over to the county yet. Now, they're going to be taking about nine houses from the county and two from Peoria. But, you know, uh, the thing is that the people are still asking me about it, and I said, I have no idea what they're doing with it, and I don't even know if they have the money or not. But the point is that right now it's four lanes, and before, on the other side, 111th, there was two lanes, right? Two, then one into four. Now you got four lanes, which goes into four, but then you got four lanes going to six. So what are you, what are you making up? You know, it's, it's still going to be, you know, for like, you understand what I'm talking about? From two lanes to four lanes, from four lanes to six lanes. Yeah, council member, what, what they're doing right now is an evaluation of the, the project across the entire corridor to determine what the lane width was. That was a, a preliminary planning exercise that showed those lanes. We, they determined that the traffic during that study um, was significantly lower recently than, than what that study showed. So um, they're going back and evaluating what the number of lanes should be, and uh, we haven't determined the, that yet across this cross section. I can tell you one thing, that there will not be an overpass over the 101 as part of this project, as part of this funded project, which was one of the biggest concerns for the neighborhood. Are you going to have a meeting with the neighborhood on this again? I, I would, uh, yes, we will have one before we start construction on this, this phase of the project, but that, that won't start until, like I said, probably 2023. 
The next one is our, one of our perennial favorites, the Vistancio Commercial Corps. Um, it's our largest shovel-ready site in the city. Um, and so we see great opportunity for this. Um, you know, in terms of the possible mix of uses, we have so much buildable land, 330 acres buildable. Um, I think we can accommodate a lot of potential uses. Um, we have had a lot of data center looks up here for a lot of the same reasons, power, water. Um, advanced business park, corporate campuses, advanced manufacturing, we know the market has validated that that works. Sports, tourism, hotel, creative office, lifestyle retail, entertainment, multifamily housing, restaurants, and healthcare. Um, I think those all can be accommodated in there. Um, obviously a multi-year build out, we want to do some master planning work with Stratford Land, planning department, whole host of individuals. Um, but I'd be interested to get some feedback from council. Is, is, is there something we missed, uh, something that should be off? Um, yes, council member. A quick question. When it says sports tourism, exactly what is that referencing? So that, that could be um, a couple executions. The one that was um, in mind, uh, you may recall that as part of the last uh, Peoria Investment Forum, we had done some initial market um, uh, studies and research to see if, if like a, a field house, an indoor um, multi-sport facility mm -hmm. could be um, accommodated. Um, so this would be um, uh, national and regional uh, indoor sports, volleyball, basketball, a host of others to get to, to grab the, 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 the tournament play um, that, that a lot of that um, sports tourism draws and, and, and to use that to build upon the tourism efforts of the North. Um, so, uh, you know, if, if you were able to bring in those types of, of, of regional and national tournaments, connect it to our golf courses, connect it to Lake Pleasant, connect it to, you know, uh, larger out of, out of um, uh, city assets, Sedona, Flagstaff, you can really start to build a mini vacation on all this stuff um, as a way to drive people, drive activity, drive traffic, to then help build a case for other types of development that would need to be there, retail, restaurant, hotel. It's a chicken and the egg, because to get the tournaments, you usually need the hotels, to get the hotels, right. you need the traffic, but you know, it could have a play there. Okay, thank you. Council member. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I think we, we obviously don't want to limit ourselves, um, and, and we could end up developing, you know, one or two or a combination of several of these options here, these, these types of development. Um, when it comes to actually creating a, a gathering place and the connectivity to the community itself, how do we protect that area from becoming a standard area or allowing um, you know, standard uh, chain establishments or drive-throughs or that kind of thing? How can we uh, protect this area from those types of of businesses? I think our best opportunity to do that is with our 50 acres. And that 50 acres, you know, it gives us, it gives us an opportunity to prescribe a different execution. Um, because for the right project, that would be a private land donation to the project. Um, now what we have to do is understand where the market is and where the opportunity is and how do we leverage the opportunity. It might be what's called um, you know, mini restaurants. It might be small uh, to start. Um, it might be 40,000 square feet to start, you know, of retail with, with small restaurant pads to get the true chef-driven, uh, non-chain um, executions. But I think that's entirely possible. Um, I think what we need to do is we need to look at a, a complete master plan that incorporates all of these uses, of these are the right uses, what's the logical place for them to be, how do we preserve gathering places, how do we connect the trails, what's pedestrian connectivity, how do we, how do we um, look at um, terracing the development intensity so that, uh, you know, away from El Mirage, right, so that you're not putting a lot of intensity on El Mirage and then you got house, houses that are affected, right? And, but I think all that can be figured out. But I think the first phase is the pivotal phase, and that's where that 50 acres comes in. You know, if, if we're gonna change the dynamic there, reimagine what it could be, that's, 
that's that opportunity. Because if we can say, this is what we're looking for, and here's 50 acres of land that you don't have to pay for, that has some value. I think that's how you start. So master plan the whole thing, know how the, all the puzzle pieces fit, understand the utilities and the water and the wastewater and the electricity and all that stuff, but then start with a phase one and to get success. That then leads to a successful phase two. Uh, so to be sure I understand, so how do we ensure that in that phase one that a, a restaurant, one of the chain restaurants or fast food restaurants that maybe wouldn't be a fit for that development would not be allowed to build there? Development agreement uh, exclusion. Okay. So we enter a development agreement and we've done this in the past where we have a tenant mix matrix and we say these are the things we want, these are the things we don't want. And that will be negotiation, but you know that's that's what it is. That's that's what it is for our for the 50-acre private land donation. Okay. And, yeah. Just again, a, a quick summary. I'm really glad you brought it chronologically. Then it is really ensure that we kind of master plan the area bit that allows flexibility, but gives some sense and expectation. Senses when we start to market that to make sure that that expectation is outlined. Uh, three, then when we begin figuring out what would be the terms, what would be the city often would have an investment in something that is a, a type of asset like this. Um, and in that, in the discussions of development agreements, we would have the control over the different terms that would be a negotiated item. And then, Chris, I don't know if there's any other land use elements that you'd like to chime in as well. Good, good question, Jeff. Certainly through, through zoning, we can, um, there, we, we have guidance through our design review manual on how a development comes about. Vistancia Commercial Corps, the, the, the uh, site under it is uh, zoned uh, Vistancia Mixed Use, and there's certain uh, land uses that are permitted, and there's a certain expectation of what that character is going to be. Now, in terms of, uh, from a zoning standpoint, and trying to uh, zone out change, that's not something that, that is within our zoning authority to do that. We look at uh, classifications of land use, so that's something where a development agreement could, could speak to, but not, not through zoning, though. But I can. <laughs> Councilmember Hunt? Where is that 50 acres? The 50 acres is, is not defined. It can be anywhere oh. in the core where it makes sense. So okay. if one execution, if somebody says, love it, we want to come in as phase one, but I want to be close to the Safeway Center because I want to build upon that existing footprint. Okay. All right. If they say, you know what, we really want to make a, a, an entrance presence. We want the, the 50 acres to be right off Ridgeline. Okay. You know, so it really just depends on the execution. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and does the same, can we do the same thing for retail businesses? I don't want to name specific retail shops, but, and I don't mean to be anti, you know, franchise or, or chains or, because there's definitely a need for that and a place for that. And we have a standard corner on Lake Pleasant and Happy Valley that brings those kinds of businesses that we all want and use. But as we continue to grow and develop areas like this, um, you know, we've got one chance to get it right, and so we want to make sure that we bring the right types of establishments and what the, the citizens are asking for. Absolutely. So the same thing applies. Same thing. And through zoning, no. Through negotiation and a development agreement, yes. And what you have to have is something to offer. And what we have to offer is that private land donation. That is your opportunity. Anything else? Okay, great. Um, this next site, um, this is the northeast corner of Lake Pleasant Parkway in Deer Valley. And I think this is a great opportunity. Um, with that larger piece uh, um, now uh, up to auction with state land, which is going to be residential, that's going to put a lot of um, opportunity on the site. And so when I look at this, I really kind of see specialty retail, restaurants, Class B office for business services, and perhaps medical office um, building um, as, as a mix of uses that could work well there. Um, I think this is one of those sites that clearly would have to work with state land, state land owned. So we're going to have to show them the value. We're going to have to show them how this can be executed. We have to show them how this makes sense. But, you know, when you look at the, some of the few larger sites in the north, this is one that I think is, is a high target. Um, and uh, I think that mix of uses um, could possibly work, but I'd be interested to see if, if you guys see it differently in terms of the mix of uses. Yes, Councilmember. Thank you, Mayor. Um, 
Well, I agree with what you're looking at, but I, I definitely don't want gas stations. I don't want a convenience store yeah. uh, that doesn't fit the area, and right. we'd have an uproar. And, yep. and it's not it's just not the right area for, for that kind of clientele. Yep, totally agree. So. Also, this, this piece of land ends up being very, very close to just a couple homes that are in the meadows there. Um, so we would have to consider that in the buffer on the yep. uh, west side also, or excuse me, east side. Yep. So are you um, asking us about this in advance of the state land sale? I mean, how is state land going to auction this off? Are we going to be able to influence that in some way? My personal belief is what we have to do is we have to show a complete execution with tenant in tow and how that value adds to the sale of their property. We have to show a value increase of a significant amount to their property. So we have to do it through, we have to do it through elimination of risk. We have to do it by adding value through developers that are interested and willing to develop, tenants that are willing to sign leases, a full ready to go execution. I think that is the only way that we can have a meaningful conversation to, to meet their interests, which are clear. We want to maximize the value of our land. And I think we can do that because we have enough development surrounding it, especially when that larger Camino parcel goes residential. I think it'll be able to show that. Do you think there's a possibility that they are going to be open to something that's not residential? Well, I, I, I think you, we don't know until we have the conversation. I know, I know in the, at least it's my impression, that the only thing that they've been willing to sell is for residential. But, you know, um, I, my motto is no harm in asking, no <laughs> harm in trying. Um, and then, you know, whatever it is, it is. But I would hate to see something go there that we're not desirous of because we didn't try. Mayor, members of council, maybe I can add a little bit to that. Um, I'll be talking about that site specifically in some of my remarks, but that site is de designated on the general plan today for community commercial. So if somebody, they would have to actually go through and rezone and attempt to change the general plan, we all have a, a role in that, in that case, so. It, it was zoned, it was put on the general plan at the same time as the Walmart? Wasn't that part of that whole thing? Well, it's designated on the general plan for community commercial. That's what we say should occur on that property. So. Uh, when we look at rezones, they have to conform to the general plan or someone would have to seek a change in the general plan and has to go through a full public process for that. Yeah. Okay, the next uh, pad, if we have a really nice large retail pad just next to the uh, existing Walmart, um, again, I think that's a, a potential high value target. Uh, you know, maybe uh, Mix of uses could be, again, specialty retail, restaurants, office condos. Maybe there's an entertainment play. Um, I know that we're all desirous of some entertainment options up there. Um, still, I'm gonna, we're going to have to show value. We're going to have to show execution. We're going to have to show tenants. Um, I have to give with the property owner and work with them, all the na normal stuff. But does that mix of possible uses sound right to you guys? It sounds right to me. Comments? Yeah, it seems well suited. Okay. Next is the northeast corner of Happy Valley and 83rd. I personally think this is a great opportunity for us to reimagine retail, um, to break the paradigm of what the market will deliver. Um, you know, we have high traffic volumes on Happy Valley, all the new stuff that's going around Happy Valley and 67th. Um, with all the incomes, the demographics, access. Um, I wouldn't mind taking a stab at going after a specialty grocer. I wouldn't mind some restaurants, some more specialty retail, some medical office. Um, as you know, we, are, we have our specialty retail restaurant entertainment strategy. We have surveys out in the community right now. Um, if we don't create the opportunities for those uses to go somewhere that's unique, that's different, place making, gathering areas, not the same old, same old, then we don't, we don't enhance our opportunity to be successful. 
um, you know, with office going into the southwest and, 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 and the 83rd marketplace and the, and, the, and the southeast, I think it started a, a change. It started a paradigm shift. And so why not build on that? Um, so I don't know if, if again, you, you see the uses as appropriate. Um, but I think that's a great opportunity also as a gateway into that part of the community. Um, that intersection, you know, you know, it matters in terms of design, feel, look, connectivity, offering. Um, so um, I'd be happy to get some of your thoughts on that uh, as to the mix of uses. Chris, real quick, um, what is that property zone on the northeast corner of the 24.7 acres? The um, northeast corner uh, is all zoned uh, residential today or general agricultural. Um, I should also add that, um, as you know, we have an active zoning case that has been submitted to the city now with that whole property, with the exception of the hard four and a half acres at the corner. Um, so there's been a number of discussions internally and also with the developer that we desire a different type of retail experience up here. So that message has been delivered. And like I said, that, that project is still in review right now. Do we know the kind of tenants that are going to go in 83 Marketplace? Uh, Mayor, members of council, 83rd Marketplace right now, um, nine acres, the western half of it, I want to say, uh, we approved a site plan for a portion of the western half, and I believe it was some specialty retail and specialty restaurants, and the eastern part has not come in for site plan yet, but I, we had a pre-app some time ago for potentially for office, so it's unknown at this time. So the site plan is approved on the, uh, on the western side. Um, we're just awaiting the submittal of building permits for that. But we don't actually know who those might we be. We don't know who the tenants are yet. Do we know if they actually have any? They've, uh, I think, I believe they've indicated they have some or all, but we haven't seen it. We haven't seen evidence of that yet. And certainly we're waiting on a building permit. Okay. Yes. Well, I can't wait to get that list on what's coming in um, to 83rd Avenue Marketplace. Uh, these two corners um, are other examples of an area where I think we really need to protect what types of restaurants and, and specialty retail, what constitutes specialty re retail goes here. So this is another area where, you know, if we can be specific about that, we can. That we should. That being said, what are the chances that we could develop this in a way that um, would appeal to the existing residential communities, enhance um, in their, from their perspective, their property values, and be able to land a specialty grocer. Um, and to expand on that a little bit, I think going after a specialty grocer for here is, or whatever we think this would fit here and serve the community here, we need to go out and ask for the absolute best. Um, not just here, but anywhere. I mean, I love hearing that from you, that if there's something that we want and we believe belongs in our city, we're, we're worthy and our citizens are deserving and we should go out and ask for it before we decide, you know, it's not gonna happen. Um, so I love hearing that from you and I feel that way about all of these different areas that we're, we're looking at developing. But again, back to my original point, I think that we definitely need to protect what types of establishments go here. And again, you know, keep it unique and different and an experience. Councilman. Thank you, Mayor. I agree with uh, Councilman Benzbacher. I, it, this is one of the last properties that we have to do it right. And not that we've done it, not done it right in the other, but to bring in just a generic um, grocery store is not appealing to me. Um, my concern is we have grocery stores in the surrounding area that are within a mile, two miles within the area. What's the, what's the market going to dictate to them? Are they going to go out of business because now the new shiny market is up the corner? Um, and also, are you looking at the, the trends of the market? Because I know with the Amazons and the, all the other industries, the, the typical supermarket is no longer um, the standard going forward. And so I think we need to look at the millennials and w what are they looking at? And you know, the, the um, scan bag and go uh, things that, that Fry's does and Amazon market where you don't even 
pay anything. It just is automatically billed to your to your account. Those are the things we need to look at, and, and I think this is the, that opportunity. And just putting in a generic, you know, cookie cut market is not something I would that I would support. But to Councilman Bensbacher doing a specialty grocery store, Trader Joe's, something like that that lends itself to the, to the community where you have it open and you know walkways to get to the community and really open it up rather than putting the standard walls behind uh, the, the center that blocks off the residents. I'd, I'd rather see you know minimal walls to where it's inviting the residents to come in and partake in the specialty shops and, and the restaurants and the, whatever businesses are there. So, yeah. thank you. Great, thank you so much for that. And this one. This is exciting. So this is our Loop 303 and Lake Pleasant Parkway. You're probably wondering, what in the heck are all of those colors? Um, when we did a real back, quick back of the napkin on, on this opportunity, some things we just got to be aware of. Um, when you look at the topography barrier, um, now that's the, the, the tan shading. There's a significant topo drop there. Um, when you look at the green line, um, that is a high pressure gas line. So that's a non buildable. Um, so when you look at uh, the, the, the true development opportunity, um, it still needs more analysis, but, but we think it yields the net acreage that you see listed here. You know, uh, 50 acres for, for, south, uh, for uh, southwest, northwest at 70, 103 for um, uh, northeast, and uh, about 14, because you also have that new river levee on that um, southeast corner. Um, but, but here, over time, we see a great uh, case that can be made for you know, corporate campuses, general office, advanced business parks, and, and Class A, certainly. Um, manufacturing, perhaps advanced manufacturing, lifestyle, retail, entertainment, multifamily. The creation of true integrated, large-scale density um, on our signature interchange here with the 303. Um, these, these, every one of these corners needs a real deep dive in terms of understanding what's there, what's possible, what, where's the market, and all that kind of stuff. But I think it's a great opportunity for our future. Um, and I just, again, wonder, do you guys agree with that mix of uses? Um, is there anything that should be listed or taken off? Can you tell us about ownership? <laughs> Yeah, so we're going to have um, state land. Sorry to bring it up. Yeah, so, so state land, whether it's the northeast corner of 83rd and Happy Valley, Deer Valley and Happy Valley, and this, so it's, it's, going to be the, it's going to be the same drill, I think. You know, we're, we're, there are some that we're, are, are more in the, in the immediate execution time frame, like Deer Valley and 83rd and Happy Valley, um, but this certainly is, is not far behind, um, and, and we're going to have to show the value. You know, it's... it's one, one, one corner of the intersection is going to have to go first. And, and so what's the execution and who can we convince to come in? You know, that'll be on me. I got to show the value. And I got to show state land the value and hopefully they'll agree with it. Yes. Thank you. Uh, how is it zoned currently? Mayor, uh, Councilmember Bensbacher. I believe this entire corner, if I'm not mistaken, we, we call it the Barney blob back, but it's all a big purple blob, which relates to an old zoning case. It's a business park industrial is the whole thing. So it just, it's reflective of an old zoning case, um, you know, a couple years ago, or two okay. decades ago, rather. No residential? No. Okay, great. So would your intention in the new general plan be to, to create a, a PAD in this area? Mayor Carlotte, members of the council, I think our intention would be to redesignate all of these properties and to the extent state land is willing to work with the city to potentially rezone the property, then that would be our opportunity to do that, to be more intentional in terms of what those specific land uses are. But certainly with a general plan update, a redesignation would, would the refinement of those properties would be, uh, would be very important to do that. So yes, PAD? Well, we're talking about two things. You're talking about zoning and I'm talking about general plan. Yeah. So right now the general plan says business park industrial. But with the types of uses that Scott's suggesting here, we would need to redesignate those properties, maybe to mixed use, maybe to some other type of commercial. And that's the general plan level. And then the second level is the actual regulations. And that's where zoning comes into play. And a, and a PAD would be, would be the right tool in that, in that regard. 
So a general plan designation, there is no PAD general plan designation? No, PAD is zoning. Yep. I see. Yep. Okay, so when you're talking about mixed use development, what is what would that general plan designation be? Well, the general, general plan designation, I would, I would um, in looking at some of the land uses here, would probably be a, a certain type of mixed use designation that allows for, you know, employment, maybe a manufacturer, maybe a, maybe a residential as part of that, but it'd be a mixed use designation, I would imagine. And then the PAD would be the specific types of uses that could go in those areas. I see. Okay. Mixed use. Got it. Yes. Um, just one question. Um, how would our sign code ordinance play into this as far as billboards? Mayor Carlott, members of the council, so our, our existing sign code does not allow billboards and our proposed sign code expressly prohibits billboards. Okay. So any development would have to comply with that. Perfect. Thank you. No more comments. It looks like everyone likes that. Okay. <laughs> awesome. So uh, at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Chris, and he's going to talk about uh, general plan and zoning in a little more detail. Great. Well, thank you for that, and I appreciate being part of this uh, presentation. I think there's a lot of synergy between the work we're going to do with the general plan update and zoning and the pre-development work that, that Scott is suggesting on some of these key sites. I think for starters, what I'd like to do is just kind of bring, you, bring yourself back to that first slide that Jeff showed. He showed the uh, economic prosperity, and if you'll remember, there were a number of pillars around that. I think a couple of those are instructive to our area. I think uh, those include diversity of retail experiences, that's going to be important going forward and how we do that, and livability. I think those play into um, how we approach the general plan. Um, certainly if we're, I believe there's a nexus between that and, and our attempt to have a more targeted development program specifically for some of those key sites that Scott's outlining. Now the challenge is always site control, right? Uh, many of the sites that Scott pointed out are privately owned, um, so we'll have to work with them on, on that. Um, and in doing that, we have to exercise, of course, a careful balance between the property rights and uh, the legal framework that we in the planning and zoning world work within, so we'll have to do that. Um, so we don't have a free hand in, in our decisions, but we do have a lot of uh, zoning tools and, and through the general plan that can help us uh, guide the way that development occurs. Um, so what I'm going to do is talk about, I've got a few slides I'll show you here. What I thought we'd do is let's first talk about the general plan and zoning, how that plays in. I think a lot of times when I, when I talk to citizens and, and, and many people, there's a misunderstanding between you know, what general plan means and what zoning means, and I'll try to provide a little more, uh, a little more distinction to that. So the general plan, uh, of course, is, a, is a, a framework that deals with future development decisions, right? Whether we're talking about redevelopment of a property or development of a vacant piece of property. But the general plan covers a variety of areas, uh, land use, circulation, uh, housing, a number of categories. Um, and, and what it is, is it's aspirational. So it's how we see the city in the future developing, um, how we would like it to develop. That's why we, sometimes when you see a designation on a property, it might have one land use, might, might be residential today, but we see it in the future to be commercial. So what we're doing is positioning the property so someday when the property comes forward and there is a, and, and the city, and there's a mature, maturation in the area and the, city, and the property sees a, uh, a bid to want to redevelop the property, the hope is that they'll redevelop in line with the general plan vision. So it provides a strategic framework for decisions going forward. What we talk about in the general plan is fit, form, and character. That's what we're trying to identify in the general plan. I'll talk about what that is. Um, first off, we look at the type of land use. So very generally, are we talking about residential, commercial, industrial, or mixed use, a mix of uses? That's something we'll look at. We'll also look at the intensity or density of these uses. We talk about that all the time. How many units per acre? If it's commercial, we, we uh, look at uh, floor area ratio, how much square footage per site or per, per uh, acre that it could uh, have on that site. Another thing we look at is uh, the development form, and I'll talk about what that means, but essentially that's the relationship of the buildings to the property, and that's very important um, as we try to identify what the appropriate character might be for an area, and that's going to be really important going forward where we try to have a more intentional development program at some of these key sites. And then always, because all these uh, uh, decisions involve the neighborhood, involve the public, so it's, it's a question of fit. How well does the land use with the uh, accompanying uh, uh, density, intensity, how does it fit in with the neighborhood? What's the fit there? What's the compatibility? And those are all things that are, that are very important uh, as, we, as we look at these decisions. 
So then going to zoning. Um, zoning is regulatory. So the difference with zoning is there is a legal description that is affixed to a piece of property. And when you look at that piece of property, zoning specifies everything. What specifically can be built there today? Um, what are the parameters that can be built? What are the height limitation? What are the landscape requirements? What's the signage? Um, all the, uh, the setbacks, all of the prescriptions for how development occurs is uh, involved in zoning. So I think the important thing to understand too is when we have a rezoning case that comes in, um, under state statute we have to make a finding that the rezoning conforms to the general plan. That's why the general plan is really important. If it does not conform, the, the, uh, the uh, applicant has the, the right, the ability to propose a change to the general plan. And that's, so sometimes you'll see a corresponding change to the general plan with the uh, zoning case that comes in. But the, but the point to make is that the, the zoning has to conform to the general plan. Um, and everything we do, we operate under an established legal framework. What I mean, what I mean by that is that um, our decisions, uh, in no way I mentioned that we don't have a free hand in development decisions, meaning that we operate under a, under a zoning and a land use uh, legal framework. Um, we're, we're guided by uh, state mandates. We have our own policies and, and uh, guidelines and how, how they direct us. So what that does is that protects the, um, the property rights of the owner, of the developer, from the city making arbitrary and capricious decisions. So our decisions have to be guided by by sound uh, regulations that we already have in play and the legal framework that we operate under. So it's all a balance. It's a key balance between property rights and trying to guide development. Okay, I'm gonna talk about a familiar slide just to provide a little more definition about how the general plan and land use comes into play. So this is the site at Deer Valley and Lake Pleasant Parkway, the northeast corner, about 20 acres here. Um, the site today is, is designated on the general plan for community commercial. That's what we say as a community we desire to have developed on that property is community commercial. The zoning today is general agricultural. So that means that uh, if, if, if somebody wanted to take advantage of that general plan designation, they're going to have to rezone the property. And so when we see the rezone, we have to make a finding that it conforms to the general plan, to the community commercial designation. And so what does it mean to conform? Um, it, it, it has to conform to um, the description of that land use category and it has to conform to the policies that, that, uh, that uh, guide and back up that category. So we'll have to look at that. One of the decisions that we'll, we'll have to look at is the develop, development form. Um, I think in this example, I believe uh, Scott was talking about a desired use matrix including specialty retail, uh, medical office, office and restaurants. And certainly those types of uses would be consistent and permitted within a community commercial designation. Um, what we didn't talk about that is the development form. And, and you recall I talked about the form meaning the relationship of the buildings to the land. And so let me provide you a couple of examples of what I mean by form. Um, this happens to be an example in North Phoenix. Near, um, it's just a little bit north of the 101 uh, near uh, Desert Ridge. If you look at the bottom half of the graphic here, uh, what you can see there are multi-story buildings, right? These are office buildings, some of these are MOB. Um, if you look at the upper part of the graphic where you can see the little guideline for Walgreens there, a little uh, icon for Walgreens, I can tell you there's also specialty retail and uh, restaurants uh, within that. Very different form. This is a form that's guided by um, larger parking fields, um, parking fields that are arranged in pods around the uh, multi-story buildings, and really without, a, I would say, a lot of um, uh, integration between the specialty retail and the, and the medical office building. So what I want to do is, is um, uh, distinguish that type of form from this type. This is a very different type of form. But this is a type of form, uh, what we call more of a Main Street experience, where you have buildings that are pushed to the street. You have a zero setback, uh, buildings that uh, two, three story perhaps. Um, you're likely to find many of these types of uses in this type of form. Now what I'm not saying is that this is necessarily the right form for every property in the city. This might make sense in certain contexts, and the other form I showed you for Desert Ridge might make sense in other contexts. What I'm just trying to uh, denote here is that there are a variety of, of forms that we have to be considerate of when we're looking at, at, land, uh, at land use cases. So back to the general plan and how it plays in. So I said right now it's community commercial. All these uses are appropriate. The community commercial designation um, identifies that uh, development form can take place in large scale buildings and it can be um, uh, in commercial areas. And uh, big box uses would also be appropriate on a site like this. 
big box is what we say is anything from 100,000 square feet and up. If we're desirous of a different type of form here, then we have an opportunity to not only revise the specific land use designation that we might uh, that we might want to apply to this property, but then we have an opportunity to redesignate the property so that when a rezone does come in, it conforms to our expectation for that property. Um, and then finally, how does that play uh, going forward? We're working through on the general plan updates. Again, update the land use designations, rather. Let's be more uh, distinctive and strengthen our existing description so we can provide for a variety of forms throughout the city. Let's be really uh, intentional in terms of uh, what those policies are and, and, and going back and looking at how we can redesignate areas based on those new land use descriptions. That's going to be very important. And then finally, you want to have a zoning code and a design manual that's also um, in alignment with that. And what I mean by that is if you've got a development form that you want to be more of a Main Street experience, what you don't want to work against is, for example, a zoning requirement that requires large parking deals. I think that destroys the whole notion of that. So you want to have some alignment between the general plan and, and the and the zoning requirements. So there will probably be a number of things that we'll have to adjust um, as we go through this process. And then design manual. We have a very good design manual, but I'm, I'm sensing that perhaps there might be some uh, opportunities for um, improving some characteristics, particularly um, you know, better placemaking um, opportunities throughout the city. And that might, be, that might be necessitate some changes to the design manual. And so with that, I will stop and entertain any questions. I should mention, I apologize, we are, are really hanging up against the time limit. So we are looking forward to more conversation on this. Needless to say, we have a lot of work ahead of us. The pre-development work on all of those different sites that we had talked about is, is also, Chris had mentioned, the general plan, zoning cone, design manual. We are <coughs> eager to bring those types of changes forward for you uh, going forward. So look forward to all of those pieces really to try and meet those specific goals. But thank you very much for your Good. Thank you. Thanks for this is very detailed and, and very informative. We appreciate it. And with that, we are adjourned until our seven o'clock meeting.
the Mayor and City Council welcome you to the Peoria City Council meeting. As a courtesy to others, please silence all phones. If you would like to address an issue that is on the agenda, or if you would like to speak to the Council regarding a non-agenda item, please complete a speaker request form, which can be found in the front lobby of the Peoria City Council Chambers or in the tray to the left of the speaker's podium. Please place the completed speaker request form in the second tray to the left of the speaker's podium labeled Request to Speak. All speakers will have three minutes to complete their comments. A countdown clock is easily visible on the left side of the wall behind the City Council dais. Only items listed on the agenda may be addressed by the Council. Since items presented as part of a speaker's request have not been listed on the agenda and due to the requirements of open meeting laws, the Council will be unable to respond to items presented as part of the speaker's request. However, please be aware that your comments will be noted. The speaker's name will be called to speak at the appropriate time in the order that the forms were received. Thank you for your interest and participation in the Peoria City Council meeting. We'll now come to order. The clerk, please call the roll. <coughs> Mayor Carlin. Here. Vice Mayor Finn. Here. Council Member Patena. Here. Council Member Vinsbacher. Here. Council Member Edwards. Here. Council Member Hunt. Here. Council Member Leone. Here. And Council Liaison Gatrist. Here. Thank you. Please rise for a moment of quiet reflection and the Pledge of Allegiance led by Council Member Vinsbacher. Welcome to the Peoria City Council meeting of February 6th, 2018. The first item on our agenda this evening is a presentation, and I would like to welcome John Sefton to the floor to begin our presentation. Well, good evening, Mayor and Council. Thank you very much. It is an honor of mine to be able to share and introduce another Peoria first, one of our more, ex another example of how Peoria is such a great place to live, work, and play. The Old Town Decorative Planter Project was inspired by Council Member Hunt's Think Tank, a collection of Old Town entrepreneurs, neighbors, and collaborators. Entitled, Past Roots, Bloom into the Future, the project has been a unique placemaking effort that has truly added to the creativity, color pop, and connection to Peoria's Old Town. Tonight's presentation is about honoring and recognizing the people and the creative process that they experienced. With funding support through Peoria's Neighborhood Grant Program, a special thanks to Chris Hawkes, Karen Imig, and Jamie Gonzalez, and the artistic guidance of the talent from WHAM, the What's Happening Art Movement, a nonprofit art-centric organization led by Connie Whitlock, Peoria's Old Town is now boasting 16 streetscape planters like none other in the world. From a makeshift studio at 83rd and Jefferson, you might recognize this little place, the project crew spent the months of last summer crafting concepts on how to bring new life into the existing planters, all with the theme of Peoria, its history, people, pets, and places. Now we certainly encourage everyone to get out and walk around Old Town and take in each of the creations, but for tonight, we have pictures. And I'll turn the talking over to Council Member Hunt and she'll tell me when to click. <laughs> Thank you, John. And welcome, I see a lot of our artists here and that just thrills me. I have gotten very close with a number of these artists because we worked so long and hard, they especially, more than I. And John, there are actually 20 planters. This is awkward with my back to you. Uh, there are actually 20 planters uh, in Old Town now. And um, do you want to go ahead and click? Uh, we're just going to go through these kind of quickly, but I want you to see the um, 
this is by Melissa Zimmer. This is a dedication to the uh, firefighters, past and present. A uh, number of different dogs that have grown up. Those are actual dogs that exist. They're not just types of dogs. And that's Linda there. Linda was our only actual community member who lives right in Old Town who uh, came on board and painted with us. And Heather, thank you very much. Heather is uh, an artist and a member of WHAM, and she did a number. Did you do three or four, Heather? Four, I, that's what I thought. So you can see that some are made with tiles, and most are actually mosaics, and some are painted, but they're, they're all beautiful. And then um, we have students, and we're, we're gonna bring all these guys up here in a minute. We have students from Pure Accelerated School also who came in, and help there with uh, Miss Lou's Arts Club. And uh, on the lower left, that is Rob Scalf. I don't know if Rob's here tonight, but he owns the bike shop, and he designed their planter and actually came and worked on it. This shows a little bit of the um, process. I think that was MJ's uh, planter there. And then on the right, um, two... Wilhelm employees who had never done anything like this. They just said, we'll do it, and they chose the largest planter that there was. They came to be sorry for that later, but they, um, and they actually had some strong guys from Wilhelm move their planter down to Wilhelm so they could work on their brakes and everything and, and work in a little bit cooler condition, but they, they had a great time. Uh, this again shows a little bit of the process. Um, Go ahead. And here again, we'll just click through these. This shows some that are out actually on 83rd Avenue. The Wilhelm planter is down in front of Wilhelm, and then there's one that's in front of Theater Works. The others are on 83rd. That's the one on the left that's in front of Theater Works. And two gentlemen, I don't know. Yes, you're one of them, is that correct? One of the. No. Okay, I guess they're not here. But two gentlemen that volunteer at Theater Works um, actually said, we'll try that. And under MJ's tutelage, they got right, as you can see, they got right down and dirty putting that together. This, again, is the people who shaped the project um, right up to the city workers who probably... I'm right in front of you, aren't I? Who who uh, probably had to go to the chiropractor after this day's work. The, uh, someone said to me, aren't you afraid they're gonna get stolen? No. <laughs> no, I'm not. They're really, really heavy. Uh, that shows the people. Again, this is part of the process uh, being shown, and it is quite a process. And then um, there's Connie. Connie, uh, who headed the whole thing, is downtown Phoenix, hopefully accepting uh, Governor's uh, Arts Award tonight. Wham was a finalist in that. We don't know yet whether they've won or not, but uh, otherwise she, she just died when she found out they were on the same night as this. But at this time, I want to honor those of you who put in all these. We figured there were over a thousand hours collectively put in on this project. So if you all will come down front here and line up. You guys were smart, you sat on the front. I know there's going to be a photo, and I know we're going to have to squish in, but let's just go down first and, and get your name and uh, what did you work on. Um, John Rainier from Renew Church, and I helped Heather with our first pot. Robert Bonneau, and I helped work on the Peoria Accelerated pot. They had several pots, by the way. Hi, I'm Kylie, and I worked on the Peoria Accelerated one. Uh, I'm Patrick Nikolic, and I helped work on the Peoria Accelerated pots. I'm Zoe McFarland, and I helped on the Peoria Accelerated Pots. Thank you. Margaret Liu, I'm the art teacher at Peoria Accelerated High School, and 
these are my awesome students that help. These kids not only worked on this, they've done two murals at the community garden, by the way, and they're gorgeous. They, they really are talented. Cassandra and I also helped with the PHS part. Christian Rodriguez, I also helped with the PHS uh, pots. And he was real active on those two murals. I'm Heather Young, and I worked on the Renew Church Planter, as well as the Bloom 365, uh, one with tortoises uh, for wham, and also the kitty cat planter. I'm Linda Fott, and um, I did the dog pot. And by the way, those dogs are still living in this neighborhood. <laughs> They're chasing cats. <laughs> I'm Cindy Wise. I work at Wilhelm Automotive, and I worked on our pot with a couple of my other coworkers, Patty and Darcy, under Connie's tutelage. And are you ready to do another pot? No. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm MJ. I'm MJ Johnson, and I helped Theater Works create theirs and a couple of others. And she's an art teacher at Cactus High School. Hi, sweetheart. Hi, I'm Cadence, and I just helped my mom and dad do pots. <laughs> she did. Those kids spent so many hours down there. Um, Melissa Zimmer, we worked on four and a half planters. We worked on the firefighters one, the bike shop, Robert. We worked on the Iron Key Studio one that has a, the sparrows and the tree and the blossoms. Um, we worked on another abstract one and then helped Linda Font on the background of one. She spent a lot of hours there, very dedicated. And she had puppies during that time too, by the way. Just want to say. Uh, I am Scott Holmes, uh, and I worked on about five different ones randomly. Just lots of pots. He's married to her, and he got the right down there. So <laughs> I'm Dawson Taylor, and I did what they told me to. <laughs> Very obedient son. Oops. I'm uh, Marcelo Stefaniak. I worked on the uh, Iron Key Studio pot. Okay, and are you an artist? Yes, ma'am. Donna Bartos, representing the teen crew of Bloom 365, bring love on others more 365 days a year. And thank you, Heather, for being so flexible, working with a group of teens and scheduling that with us. It was outstanding. Okay, let's give them another big round of applause. <laughs> and instead of a plaque or something which... Uh, it's like your baseball trophy when you were a kid. After you kind of grew up, you don't know what to do with it. And uh, we did a commemorative book for them that pretty much mirrors the slides that we had up there. So this was a labor of love, a complete commitment. You guys know how hot it got this summer, and they were out in that. And not only that, the tin is all torn off the back, and so the wind would blow and bring dirt in. And Melissa almost had a breakdown when she had it all, the stuff, the white stuff put on it, and the wind came in before she, it was a mess. So, but we know artists uh, suffer for their art. So thank you all very much for honoring them. And thank you again, artists. <clears throat> One more. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Hunt, for your leadership on that project. And thanks to all of you. You have changed the appearance and the beauty of our downtown forever. We appreciate all of your work. All right. So we will now proceed to the consent agenda. All items listed on the consent agenda are considered to be routine or have been previously reviewed by the City Council and will be enacted by one motion unless a council member requests an item to be removed. I have no request for an item to be removed. Council, do I have a uh, motion on the consent agenda? No motion. Second. second. I have a motion and a second. Council, please vote. And the consent agenda passes unanimously. 
And we will now move on to the Vistancia West Community Facilities District Board Meeting. And this board meeting will hear a consent agenda consisting of two items. The first one is the minutes from the December 12th, 2017 meeting. And the second is the investment report for quarter ending 12-31-17. Uh, board members, are there any items to be removed from consent? Seeing none, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. Please vote. And the consent agenda passes unanimously. And the next item on the agenda is call to the public for non-agenda items. And I do have one speaker request form from Mr. Jerry Johnson. If you would please go to the podium and state your name and address for the record. I'm Jerry Johnson at uh, 19134 North 84th Drive in, Pe in Peoria at Westbrook Village. And I have to do a change here. <laughs> I was dared, I think. <laughs> but I just want to uh, say a huge thank you for the, uh, to the city council, mayor and council, for the invitation and the opportunity to attend the first, I think it was the first, uh, uh, Peoria Neighborhood Day at the legislature. It was a fantastic day. Um, I learned a lot, and it was just a great all around. And uh, we got to meet so many people, as well as Council Member Edwards and Council Member Binsbacher was there as well. I hope I didn't tread on your uh, reports, but, uh, but we had a great time there. And I also want to thank Thomas and Jennifer for, uh, for the organization of that and putting that whole thing together. It was just great, and I hope that you continue that it's, so it's educational to the residents of uh, Peoria. So, Council Member Patena, thank you for the invitation. Really appreciate it. And again, thanks for the city for allowing us to do that. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. All right. So we will now move on to reports from the city manager, Mr. Tyne. Great. Thank you, Mayor and Council. And um, actually, I have a few items that we were eager to speak to you about today. And first off, we wanted to uh, introduce you again to Ed Stripler. He is our Architectural Services Manager to give you an important update on our Northern Community Park project. And go ahead, Ed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tyne, and good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, this evening, I'll be updating you and our citizens watching on TV on the status of the Northern Community Park project. We'll revisit Excuse me. We'll revisit the predictions we made about 18 months ago about the project challenges that we saw then. We'll talk about our cultural resource findings, how they introduced a significant impact to the project timeline. I'll quickly recap the final design elements in the park, just to catch everybody up on what's planned for construction, and I'll offer a forward glimpse at how the park may evolve in a future decade. Last but not least, we'll talk about the path forward from here, and answer everybody's number one question, which is when will the park construction start and when will it be open to the public? <clears throat> uh, excuse me, sorry. This slide is from our uh, June, or excuse me, July of 2016 presentation that I made to the council at the time that we had completed the park master plan. That was about 18 months ago, um, and the council awarded a contract for both the design and the pre-construction services uh, on the park to our design builder, a team of uh, hunter contracting and valuing construction. Just to flash back, for reference, on Pioneer Park, our second community park, uh, construction was awarded in May of 2012. The economy had not yet fully recovered from the Great Recession, and we had high buying power when we entered into our construction contract. Fast forward to our northern community park in 2018, and the picture's a little bit different. Uh, we have a very different market, at this time, unemployment's at an all-time low. The construction industry suffers from a lack of workers. And we have a complicated site at the very far outskirts of our valley. So in contrast to Pioneer Park, our buying power on this park is a little bit different. We went into design knowing uh, that we would have to make some tough decisions on what to build now and what to build later uh, due to these climbing construction costs. Regarding schedule, one of the icons up there, during the period in design when we all needed all of the government entities to come together and fire on all cylinders to perform timely, we didn't do too bad. Um, later I'll show you a slide that shows all the different political entities involved from our level all the way up to the federal government. Our downscoping of the project, however, midstream, in order to meet our budget objectives, did unfortunately have a, 
adverse impact on our timeline. And about all that hard dirt, well, it's still out there and it's still hard and it's still going to be a challenge, um, both during construction, um, but, it be, but it also became not only about digging through the dirt, but figuring out where to put the dirt once we dug it up, because apparently you can't leave your dirt laying around in the middle of a damp impoundment pool. So we have to find a donor location for our dirt when we ultimately begin construction. We got a little nerdy um, in the design phase. We were all focused on trying to foresee what we couldn't see below the ground plane. And this uh, colorful diagram, uh, we actually hired a geophysical consultant to come out and study our little portion of Earth and tell us what we couldn't see below the ground. The various layers of soil sediment on the north side of West Wing Mountain all the way north to the 303. Our goal was to understand what were these various layers of soil, what were the depths to bedrock, how hard would it be to, be to dig through some of this caliche. Um, the image also shows a profile of the park um, both north to south and east to west, and we used this image to try to figure out where, if we could, locate an irrigation well. Our investment helped us to identify these depths of groundwater, um, and our consultant unfortunately concluded that there may be a potential for an irrigation well to cause differential earth settlement very close to the earth and dam structure. So we reached an agreement with Flood Control District to take a weight and measure approach um, and watch um, whether we have any measurable, measurable subsidence introduced by our production well at the Loop 303 and Lake Pleasant Parkway. So initially, um, we're going to be reclaim ready. We'll brought all the infrastructure up and over the levee infrastructure. So someday, if we can find a reclaim source nearby, we can feed the park with reclaim. Um, but near term, we will be using potable water. We were so diligent in studying what was happening below the ground uh, that we weren't necessarily realizing that our critical, critical path impact, our biggest critical impact, path impact was right there in front of us on the ground. In the upper right hand image, if you can see clearly on your monitor, uh, there are a lot of little pink flags out in the desert. And what those are are the result of a cultural resource survey that surveyed the 450 acre parcel that we're building our park upon uh, that is owned by the Flood Control District of Maricopa County behind the dam. The image on the lower right, to many of us, it's not obvious to our untrained eye, uh, but what's shown is a portion of an earthenware handle from a 300 to 1300 AD period earthenware pot, believed to be from our Hohokam uh, Peoria residence. The middle image uh, uh, behind the, the, the two um, photographs uh, represents um, the cultural resources that we knew about on our site when we chose this. Um, back when they constructed the dam, there were of course environmental studies done and we knew um, that there were some cultural resources to be found. But since the dam had never flooded to this level, uh, they were still there. And federal law and state law requires us to go back, resurvey the site, and compare those results against any new findings in the last 30 years. The left-hand image, that bold line in the center represents that same 450 acres. And the red line in the yellow square represents approximately the 85 acres that we are touching. The point in this diagram is what we didn't know at the time was that we actually probably chose the site with the least cultural resources, anywhere within a multi-mile radius of the site we actually chose. All of those gray uh, shapes that you see surrounding the perimeter of the community park site are all known and documented cultural resource sites. So by and far, um, we did pretty well. Um, we can thank Mr. Granger for his forethought in picking this site. <laughs> Looking at the specific impacts of the cultural resources on the park design plan, the areas in the image that you see in the orange, the large blob in the upper um, portion of the image uh, happens to be under our future playground and picnic ramadas. Uh, the orange blob to the right that you can see impacting the lake uh, is obviously something that we have to excavate since it's right there and our lake is going to be 20 feet deep. But there are some outliers, three and four, the first being to the center portion of the image off to the right. We're voluntarily choosing to conduct site discovery on this site, um, not because of its immediate impact to our park, but because future phases, which we'll talk about, may get awfully close to this, and passive recreation trails may introduce the opportunity to influence this site negatively. Last, uh, the larger blob in the lower right corner portion of the screen is much, much closer to New River Dam and is on the side of West Wing Mountain. So any of the trail planning that we're uh, currently underway on has to take into consideration 
you know, the sensitivity of these locations. So on to the final site plan. What is it that we will be building? So on your screen, Marin Council, you can see a much uh, bolder uh, central image, very colorful. Uh, you can make out uh, various park features, but you see lighter shaded areas off to the right-hand side of the image. Let me explain the difference. Everything that we'll be building is in bold, uh, rich colors and represents approximately 85 acres of development. That's just a few acres more than our sister park, Pioneer, uh, to the south in the Acacia District. Those are that are in the shaded, excuse me, areas on the right-hand side are on the other side of the park's most defining feature, and that's a central wash uh, basin that comes down through the center of the site. It's a federally protected 404 wash. So day one, our first phase of construction, we're being good environmental stu stewards and staying on our side of the line. And then in the future, should we expand, uh, we'll take the appropriate measures to cross that wash sensitively um, and build uh, possibly one or even multiple phases of additional park construction. Our goal is to build the initial phase, gauge the uh, relative success of the park, the needs of the, of the residents, and then whether or not more soccer type fields would be added in the lower right of the screen or possibly more baseball fields be added in the upper right of the screen uh, is a future decision for the council. So in short, in this image, uh, the park will have four uh, lit baseball fields, uh, a lit three field soccer complex, plus ample amounts of multi-use turf. Uh, when not playing soccer, this becomes the great event lawn in the north portion of the city. We'll have our fishing lake, which doubles as our irrigation reservoir, our three cell dog park, uh, with turf, and just like Pioneer Park, of course, playgrounds, splash pads, picnic ramadas, concession and restroom buildings, and a park maintenance compound. So, what is the path forward to park opening? Well, I'm pleased to announce that on the caption below the image on the right-hand side, you see in red 100%, that represents the completion level of the drawings at this state. We're done, we finished, we're excited. The 300 sheet drawing set is making its way through its second round of agency review comments through all the agencies that you see listed on the screen. Both Peoria, Flood Control District, and Maricopa County, Maricopa County Environmental Services, and our friends at the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. I'd like to just take a minute to acknowledge, excuse me, all of the staff, both on the owner operating side of the park, as well as on the development side of the city, who have all labored over this 300 sheet drawing set uh, and done so uh, diligently and rapidly to maintain the project schedule. Competitive bidding. With the drawings complete, it's that time uh, of the project to figure out exactly what it's gonna cost and move into a construction contract. Peoria needs highly qualified subcontractors to construct the park, but we also need a high amount of market competition to hit our construction budget. To accomplish this, Peoria stepped forward to advertise the project on behalf of the design build team, leveraging our advertising resources. Um, and it wasn't to our normal audience of general contractors, but rather to the subcontractor community. In the images on the screen in the development services building just last week, uh, we packed the lobby, the point of view conference room, and yet another conference room, standing room only, with subcontractor interest on this project. We're very excited to report that we have over 80 subcontractors uh, coming to the table looking to work here in Peoria on this project. The big news is, is that including Peoria, there's over $120 million of park construction in the queue right now here in the Valley across Peoria, Gilbert, Avondale, and Goodyear, which means that we're all competing for the same construction resources. So we're excited to announce that we're first in line and we're wrapping up all the talent, so we'll get ours done and uh, good luck to those folks. <clears throat> Peoria will receive the bids on behalf of the design builder. In addition to managing the project, Hunter Contracting and Valley Rain Construction have an interest in self-performing portions of the work that they're quite good at. So just to keep competition uh, equal and fair, uh, all contractors will be submitting their bids to the city um, so that everybody has a chance uh, to do so in good faith. So reviewing the schedule was just about, just over two years ago, we recommended and the council approved the proposed park site. Approximately 18 months ago, the council awarded the design build agreement. We began design from a master plan concept. This spring and summer, our focus will be on finalizing the bidding, finalizing the permitting, assembling that guaranteed maximum price for construction, bringing it to you, the council, for approval, 
and conducting the cultural data recovery on the site. We're going to present the guaranteed maximum price to the council for approval at the June 5th council meeting. We're also targeting that same council meeting to bring forward the proposed name for the park for the council's consideration. I wish we could make it both go as well as grow faster, but construction will take until the winter of 2019-2020 uh, with the wild card being whether or not the weather cooperates. We need to fully establish these sports fields before we put uh, a high volume of use on it. So just to wrap up, and if I can take one minute uh, just before uh, the council's questions, um, I'd like to take uh, a second and publicly credit all of those other agencies who worked very hard to make this project a reality for Peoria citizens. First, the Bureau of Land Management, who ultimately was the initial say-so on whether this park was compatible uh, with the covenants on this piece of land behind the dam. The state, Arizona State Office of Historic Preservation, otherwise referred to as SHPO, their hard work just starts now as they review our cultural findings on the surface, and it'll also review anything that we find buried during our site data recovery later this summer. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, both here in Phoenix and Los Angeles, have been absolute troopers and have waded to, through funding challenges on their side uh, to actually pull our project forward and uh, do their reviews in a timely manner. And last but not least, our partners at the Flood Control District in Maricopa County, whose land is the land that we're building upon under an IGA. They've been an excellent partner and an advocate all the way along on this project, working with us at every turn on the technical issues uh, to solve complicated hydrology challenges, uh, but more importantly, also to push that 300 sheet set of drawings forward toward permit. So with that, Mayor and Council, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. What a great presentation. Councilmember Binsbacher, did I see you? I did. Did I push my button? No. I meant to. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Mayor. Um, Ed, thank you so much for that presentation. You're um, and I, I, I just would, you know, this is a long-awaited park um, in the Mesquite District, which happens to be the district that I serve, but I, this is just a, a very important project to the entire city of Peoria, and I just wanna thank you and the entire Peoria team for your effort in getting us to this point, and all of the partners. This collaboration is unbelievable, what has gone into this, and um, preserving our city's history and cultural resources is just a very important part of development. Um, and I realize that, and I hope that our citizens appreciate it, um, because it is very important. After getting over the initial you know, disappointment and shock about the delay um, on developing this park on our, our free land, <laughs> <laughs> which I guess nothing's really free, but um, I have no doubt in my mind that this is the best place for this park and it is going to be absolutely beautiful and our citizens are going to love it and it's going to be used to the fullest and uh, we'll be looking forward to phase two immediately. <laughs> so the sooner the better. Um, thank you again for this presentation and everyone's hard work on this. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Yeah, I, I certainly appreciate you letting us be updated at this point. Um, I hope that you'll come back frequently. I get the question all the time. When is the park coming? When is the park coming? So just always keep us informed. We appreciate it. Thanks for all your work. Great. Thank you, Mr. Stripper. I appreciate that. Uh, next up, uh, we would speak to, just as Mr. Johnson had predicted, the Peoria <laughs> Neighborhood Day at the legislature. So with that, we do have Thomas Atkins, our Intergovernmental Affairs Director, to discuss the event. Thank you, Mr. Tyne. Mayor and Council, it's my honor and privilege tonight to give you a brief update on an event that went really well that the city hosted down at the state capitol last week. But first, the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say. So shortly after Mr. Tyne uh, took the reins as city manager, he brought the leadership team together. And he directed us as listing sort of his goals for the future. One of those goals was to be more resident focused and to quote in my notes, it says, personalize the experience for residents. So in my notes, I also have written, what in the world does this mean for intergovernmental <laughs> affairs? <laughs> One answer to that question that I've come up with and thinking about it and talking, working with everybody was Peoria, Day at the, Peoria Neighborhood Day at the legislature. 
So our goal with this event was to develop and strengthen the relationships between our Peoria legislators and the Peoria residents and Peoria to city council members that were able to attend. And we think we were pretty successful with that. Our day began with a, a super exciting, I might add, briefing of the legislative process that I gave. I'm joking about that. <laughs> Uh, but thankfully, interspersed through this briefing were some of our uh, meetings with our legislative delegation. Uh, so that included Senator Karen Fan, who's in the picture on the left, and Representative Rick Gray, who was just appointed to fill the vacancy uh, not long ago. We also had presentations by Representative um, David Livingston and Representative Ben Talma. We also had a, a really cool presentation by the new Sergeant at Arms at the Arizona House of Representatives, who's a Peoria resident that you may know, Chuck Fitzgerald. Our legislators then took our group on a, a kind of a cool VIP behind the scenes tour of the legislature. Uh, this picture here is on the floor of the um, Arizona House of Representatives. I worked at the House for uh, many years and even staff members are not allowed on the floor. It's uh, something that we don't do. So getting to go onto the floor is a really unique privilege and we are grateful for in this picture, Representative Livingston and Gray to take us onto the floor. Later that day, um, the legislators also gave a nice formal introduction to our group uh, during the floor session of the House of Representatives, which was a really nice uh, highlight. So other highlights that day included a, a really nice lunch that was provided by the League of Arizona Cities and Towns, where we met with some other legislators uh, and League staff provided a, a kind of a cool briefing on their role at the legislature and how we work with them. Um, after that, we were able to take our residents back to the legislature and help walk them through the process to sign into what they call the request to speak system. This is a system that the legislature uses so that residents can weigh in on legislation that's pending before the legislature. The cool thing now is after you sign in at the Capitol, you can now sign in from any computer in the world to weigh in on a bill. So we're hopeful that our residents will be able to have their voices heard in the future. Lastly, um, <clears throat> always trying to do better and improve, this being our first time at this, we sent out a survey to all the attendees to get their feedback on ways that we can improve. We're really grateful that a lot of the feedback, as Mr. Johnson has been very kind to say today, has been very positive. Um, but truly, it is a joy to be down at the Capitol when we have such a great city to represent. And what makes our city great is, at its core, a really great group of residents that care about their community, that are engaged, that elect a city council that's actively engaged in preserving the quality of our city. And so the result of that is that we have a really, really good reputation at the legislature, which makes my job and the job of Intergovernmental Affairs team much easier. Um, before I go on, I just want to say I want to quick thank, quickly thank um, council for your support in helping to identify the residents to attend this meeting. Uh, for those that attended, we thank you for that. I also want to give a special thanks to Jenna Carrico uh, in Intergovernmental Affairs. She did a, a lot of the lion's share of the uh, operational work and legwork in getting this together. Um, she's very organized, and I think that was reflected in our event. I also want to thank Beth Olinger, um, an executive assistant that works with us, who did a lot of work at the event. And also one of the unsung heroes of the city of Peoria, Mike Iverson, who is a graphic designer in the communications department. Uh, he really does make us look good, and we're really grateful for his work and the support that communications provide. And lastly, always we want to thank the residents um, that attended and that were just here. Uh, we're really grateful for that. This is a long way of saying, Peoria, we think our, our future is very bright, so bright, in fact, that we, uh, we need to wear shades. <laughs> so with that, uh, if there's any questions, and thank you again. It's a good-looking group there. <laughs> Council, any questions or comments? Council Member Ben Spucker. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so I just want to thank you, Thomas and Jenna and Beth, for um, putting all of this together. Not, this was just a fantastic day for the citizens that were able to attend and for us council members that were there. It was just a great experience. But I have to expand on what you're saying just a little bit, that it's really not known to everyone, to the public, and, and probably a lot of folks in the city, um, the work that you all do to represent uh, your city. And, and not just all of us here, but the citizens and, and legislation that is coming forward that directly impacts our citizens, uh, our businesses, 
and how you all are there doing amazing work uh, to make sure that we're represented well. And the, the relationships that you are forming, and I know you talked about how great it is to work with the, the council and the leadership team and how we do such a good job of forming those relationships and making your job easier. But it is hard work for all of you to be down there and maintain those relationships, respectful, straightforward relationships where the doors open and you can go in and speak to our representatives. Um, and be heard and make sure that Peoria is heard. It's very, very important work and I'm very, very grateful for what you do. I think all of us are. And they made it a point to all say um, how important it is for citizens to engage and be heard and how powerful citizens can be. Um, the one question I do have is, I'm not clear on if you actually have to be present to sign up or if you can do that remotely. And um, I heard both messages, both responses, and I think that's important information to know so that we can share that, because if people don't have to go, we could probably encourage a lot of people to get signed up, to weigh in on those bills. I've always been told, Mayor and Councilmember Binsbacher, I've always been told that um, we needed to be present the first time you signed you in okay. for security reasons, but I don't know that definitively. If you go to the legislature's website, which is azleg.gov, um, right on the front page there is a request to speak icon and uh, residents are give it a shot see if they can sign in from home okay. but I've always been told you had to be present but all we'll right check that. I know plenty of residents <laughs> that will want to give it a shot thank you thank you councilmember Edwards thank you mayor uh, Thomas I want to echo uh, Bridget's comments um, you guys did a phenomenal job down there and the relationship that uh, you and Jenna have down there is second to none um, just listening to you um, explain things to, to the residents and then watching the interaction between them and their elected officials uh, was just awe-inspiring. I mean, they were, they were treated with respect. They, they, any question uh, that they wanted to ask was answered to the fullest of their ability. And it just really shows that there's true transparency uh, between the local government and the citizens of Pure. So I want to thank you for that. The one thing I would encourage you to maybe do to expand this program is maybe somehow incorporate this into our uh, PLI, Peoria Leadership Institute, is maybe make that part of, um, you know, maybe time this so that um, it coincides with that training. Because I think, you know, those are the residents that really see a need, you know, want to be part of, of local government, and what better way is maybe to finish it out, taking them all down to, to the, uh, the state capitol. So again, thank you so much for everything you and, and Jenna did. Thank you, Mayor. And, and to your point, Council Member, good news to report. Um, the schedule for the 2018 PLI Institute, uh, the Intergovernmental Affairs team, we we're, we're going to be part of that for the first time. Uh, again, part of that direction of providing more direct service to our residents. So just the exact line of thinking is what I've been. This is a great opportunity to kind of recruit some more, more residents for the next go-round uh, as well. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks very Thanks. much. Thank you, Mr. Atkins. Um, an item we wanted to next show was the upcoming city events. It is the season for us of special events in February and March, and so I believe we have five different events that we'll show you in this airing.
Needless to say, a lot of variety of different opportunities. Looking forward to especially the Shakespeare on the Park, our first annual event there. Uh, if I may, one last item I wanted to mention is that uh, there's a significant change happening to our leadership team. Uh, and that is with the departure of Julie Arendal. Julie will be the next city manager for the city of Goodyear, Arizona. Uh, this is, of course, a bittersweet moment for all of us because one can't overstate uh, the impact that she's had on the Peoria community. She's been involved in so many different activities, including really structuring our labor management function, really being involved with our public safety over the last couple of years and helping to oversee that function, and also helping to really steward the economic development implementation strategy. Uh, but most importantly, we all remember her for her poise, her professionalism, her compassion that she has brought uh, to the job. So we're just uh, so excited for her, but it's of course a loss. Uh, to us. Uh, and one last, of course, um, we'll talk more about her successor at the next meeting who is not able to be here tonight, so we'll look forward to bringing that up at the next meeting. But thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we will now move on to reports from the City Council, and we'll start with Council Member Patena. <clears throat> thank you, Mayor. On uh, January 24th, I had the opportunity to go uh, to the retirement party for uh, uh, Deputy Chief Rick Picard. Rick, uh, chose a career of service to others. He did this for 35 years in the city of Peoria. While I was there, uh, Chief Reese said <clears throat> he actually had badge number nine, and when he started with Peoria, there was 12,000 people. He, uh, he wasn't satisfied with the status quo, and he worked his way up all the way to a de deputy chief. So uh, we certainly wish him the best in his retirement. On January 29th, I attended the groundbreaking uh, ceremony for the Maricopa Integrated Health System at Cotton Crossing and Grand Avenue. Uh, they're going to have a, a dental clinic, behavioral health. They're going to uh, train doctors and nurses. This is uh, not only a great addition and will be serving people, all the people in the West Valley, but it is especially important that it's in, in Peoria, so we're, we're happy to have them. Uh, on January 31st, I attended the Peoria Neighborhood Day at the legislature, uh, thanks to Thomas Atkins and Jenna Carrico. It was a fun day. I got to take with me uh, Jerry Johnson and Russell Chance and Karen Halstead. Uh, we, got to, we got to go into the back rooms of the Senate and the le uh, House, and uh, we were recognized at the House chamber. It was a great event. Got to hear a lot of our uh, legislators talk. And uh, I hope to continue that. It was really a lot of fun. On February 3rd, um, I, along with uh, Council Member Binsbacher and the mayor, attended uh, a Benavia, their gala celebration. Mm -hmm. Peoria has been a supporter of Benavia for well over 20 years. Uh, they are a premier not-for-profit uh, in the West Valley, and uh, the city of Peoria is always help, uh, happy to support them. And so I would also like to say uh, goodbye to Julie Arendahl. She's been with the city for five years. Uh, she was a great deputy and, and a wonderful communicator. You know, when we get promotions in jobs, um, most of us think we, we kind of have a honeymoon period where we don't have to do too much because we're learning. Uh, that really wasn't the case with Julie at all. I remember mentioning to the mayor and to several council people that when she got promoted to this position, she just jumped right in uh, and, and took the reins and, and was just, just did an amazing job. So uh, we want to wish her well. Good year's gain is certainly our loss, and, and we will miss you. But we'll be in touch, I'm sure. And let's see. Uh, the, plant, the planters. Uh, thank you, Vicki, for taking uh, charge of that. And thank all the artists uh, for helping make the uh, downtown Peoria more beautiful. I personally don't have a creative bone in my body, so I appreciate great art and I appreciate artists. Um, it will certainly enhance our downtown. Uh, if you look at the pots, they're very colorful. I'm a child of the 60s, so I love color. And uh, I think it'll be uh, uh, great for our downtown area for many, many years. That's all I have, Mayor, thank you. Thank you, child of the 60s. <laughs> <laughs> Council Member Binsbacher. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I've talked a lot, so I'm going to say what he said. He said some very nice things, so um, I agree. And congratulations, Julie, for the five years that you gave us. Uh, 
Peoria is better because of those five years. You've contributed in a tremendous way, and uh, we are going to miss you. Congratulations, and I wish you well. Uh, I, the one thing I do want to cover, two things actually, and I'll, I'll make this as brief as I possibly can. Um, I went on two public safety rides in the last two weeks, and one of them was at Station 192 with the Low Acuity team, and the Low Acuity uh, team goes out on calls that just require uh, basic life support, and uh, so that the uh, four-man truck does not have to go out on more basic calls, which are mostly medical calls. Um, it was such an eye-opener, and everyone, the entire crew and um, that team welcomed me and spent a lot of time helping me to understand that program, along with the community, community paramedicine piece that is part of that as well. Um, it was such an eye-opener and time well spent, and I encourage everyone to do it. It is absolutely responsible use of our resources, um, responsible use of our tax dollars. The impact is tremendous. It takes the already fantastic service that we're providing, you know, from here to here. Um, so uh, just very proud of that effort and, and appreciate what I was able to learn and gain from that experience. Also, I had the opportunity to ride, uh, for, spend the morning um, with the homeless outreach team and spent some time with uh, Detective Scott and went in the, in the Ranger um, River Bottoms. Uh, it was unbelievable. I had no idea what to expect. Again, an unbelievable eye-opener as to what we're doing and taking service, public service, to a whole nother level. Um, a fantastic program, great use of resources, and my respect and admiration for our public safety um, is off the charts. Um, it's always been high because of, of what they do, um, but this was just another opportunity for me to get in there and learn and understand um, just the amazing work that they're doing and, and why I don't have those jobs. Um, but thank you, police and fire, and um, I appreciate the experience. That's all I have, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor Finn. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Julie, I want to I want to um, kind of repeat what what um, Bridget said that that Peoria is truly a better place with you have been been here. So uh, we wish you all the best. I personally wish you all the best. I think you're going to do a fantastic job. Our loss, their gain, but um, I'm really really happy for you. So best of luck to you. Um, I also wanted to tell uh, Council Member Hunt, I thought you did a phenomenal job in your presentation there with the pot, so very well done, Thank you. very nicely done. Um, and then I want to kind of do a shout out to the police department. Um, uh, Bridget got to see kind of the action there on the trucks. I got to see some behind the things um, happening with the police department. They were kind enough to attend uh, the Crown Point HOA. Uh, annual meeting, which believe it or not, there were a lot of people there, and they did an amazing job doing a presentation and talking to them about things to look for in the neighborhood, how to be a better observer, what to look for with examples. It was really a great presentation. It's kind of the behind the scenes things that maybe the public doesn't always see that they do for us, and um, I think they do a phenomenal job. Another example, I was on the Nextdoor app, and if you've ever been on that app, you can see things kind of get a little crazy sometimes. I think you guys call it a 980, but I'm not sure. But um, <clears throat> there was one where somebody who just moved to the city of Peoria, it's their first experience in Peoria, in a very isolated location in the, in the city where uh, some people knew that the house had been sitting vacant for a while. And this particular person reached out on Nextdoor, and I contacted... Uh, the police and said, hey, this is kind of what's going on. They were out there that same day to talk to that uh, brand new resident. Their first taste of the city of Peoria is getting a personal touch from our police department coming out and having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with them, talking about, hey, what's happening? We're here for you. This is what you should be doing. It ends up with a selfie, including the police officers uh, on the app. So uh, it's amazing that they could go out there and have that personal touch and and touch that resident, and that's truly what Pure is about. I thought it was just a phenomenal story, and that's just some of the things that 
a lot of the public doesn't see behind the scenes that our public safety does. So that was a great, um, a great story for me. And then um, I also attended the uh, uh, Benavia event and learned that there's going to be a 52% increase in cases of dementia in the next five years. That's actually a, a fact that we were given. So I wanted to remind Council Member Patina that I was actually there with you. You didn't mention me. Right, right. I was there. Remember, we, we talked. We, right. Okay, good. Okay. That's all I have. He's a child of the 60s. Oh, and he's a child of the 60s. Right. That's it's a, a, a 60s. It doesn't look yes. obvious. <laughs> Council Member Edwards. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I just want to be brief, Julia. I just want to wish you the best of luck in your new position. Our, our loss is Goodyear's gain, so I just really want to wish you the best of luck over there. Um, but also, Jeff, to, to you for recognizing within your staff um, the, the um, succession level. Or the, you know, and you're really taking the time to groom um, the people that are coming up, and it's really uh, nice to see that we're looking internally for when people decide to move on, that you're looking internally rather than taking it outside because you have such, we have such knowledge base within our city, and it is so nice to see that you're recognizing that. So thank you for everything you're doing. That's all, Mayor. Thank you. Council Member Hunt. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Wow, after watching that video a few minutes ago, we've got a lot going on in Peoria. No one should ever say there's nothing to do because there is a ton to do. I guess I would like to really, I have a special uh, commitment and feeling for the Shakespeare in the Park. Uh, we started talking about this uh, more than a year ago and we're bringing it to fruition this year through John's department and through Mary Lou, our arts director. and and many, many others. And I just want to stress, bring your little kids to this. It's not stuffy Shakespeare. Um, it's going to be fun. The gestures, the stilt walkers, the face painting. Shakespeare had fun in his life. And, and the people that went to his plays, they had fun. And so we, we really want to give that impression, starting with our children, uh, so that when they read Shakespeare in school, they know that it was, uh, it's not just something that you can't understand. Um, and MIHS, the Maricopa Integrated Health System, what a coup for our city and especially for the Acacia District. Uh, this plot of land has sat empty for way too long and uh, they're going to be such an attribute to our community. Uh, Especially, they will have a, dial a dialysis lab. They'll have a, a committed burn unit. Uh, there'll be uh, things that people can get right here from all of the west side and not have to go all the way down on Roosevelt to get it. So um, the, the downside is it will be 2020 before they open because when you're building a hospital, you're not just building a building, it has all the, the wiring and the tubes and everything in it, so it's, it's quite a feat. But anyway, I'm very proud to have helped open that. Uh, and then I wanna thank staff for my most recent Park Fest at Murphy, and uh, kudos to this group over here. Wow, you guys just show up with your big boy trucks and uh, what they did, that this is Ask Me. And we found out that Big and little, folks like those big trucks, and you can see them go by on your street, but when you're standing next to them, they're really kind of powerful. Um, what I really appreciated that they did was they had a whole educational setup uh, where they, and people were standing there listening and just finding out things about um, what they do about water and resources and things like that that uh, ordinarily you just don't have an opportunity to do. And so it was very, very powerful. I also want to thank uh, Commander Jason Christofferson and the Chief for attending and actually uh, Commander Christofferson presented at my community meeting a, a week or so ago in Old Town here, and we had a really good, um, had almost about 40 people there, and they had lots of questions about uh, public safety and about, oh, gun issues and things like that, about the homeless, about the cats. Um, it was very wide range of, of questions and comments, and um, Commander Christofferson, in his usual manner, did a great job with the crowd. 
And I want to wish everybody uh, beautiful days ahead. We just enjoy this weather. And be sure you watch the news so you can just see how miserable everybody else is. Council Member Leone. I got to get, get up here. Thank you. Uh, first thing I want to congratulate Vic Picard for his retirement from the fire department. Uh, he spent over 30 years in it, and uh, he's been doing a great job. And I just want to congratulate him and hope that he has a great retirement. And now you can go on vacation for three or four months at a time. <laughs> I'd also like to uh, mention I went to the groundbreaking uh, for the MIHS for the uh, Maricopa County Healthcare. It's going to be a great building. It's going to be close to home. And I think it's important that we had this building years ago, but now is the time. So uh, I just want to congratulate everybody who put the time in to get this building here. The other thing I want to mention is neighborhood pride we have coming up in the Pine District. We get about 150 volunteers will help residents in the neighborhood near 91st Avenue and all of with need repairs like like uh, the houses painted, fence repaired, and uh, on warranty terms. I think it's important that we take care of our constituents in our neighborhood to make them all look good and uh, whatever we can do to help them, we're going to do it. I also want to mention that Cheyenne, on March 24th, we get a uh, shred-a-thon. And that, that's also important. So if you've got any papers that you don't want anybody to look at, uh, old bills, uh, you know, how they can get a hold of you, come on down, bring all your old bills down, income tax, and get, and get them shredded, because that's very important that you do that. Also, on April 14th, uh, at Scotland Yard Park, we get a, uh, a fest mart there. We're going to have movies. We're going to have free food there, hot dogs and Cokes and everything else. And the movie's going to be Coco. When I told my wife, she says, she's going to go and see that movie. I have no idea what it is. But I think it's going to be great, not for the kids, but for the parents. Now, I have, I have four shredathons a year. And also, we have two uh, fest park a year. And, and it's important to have these uh, for the kids and for the parents. Uh, I do want to thank Stewart for uh, doing the streets in Country Meadows and in Sun Air. Everybody likes them. They all look good, but you got a long ways to go. <laughs> so I just want to mention that, and I want to thank each and every one of you. God bless you, and God bless America. Thank you. Thank you. Youth Council Liaison, get trust. Thank you, Mayor and Council. On Thursday, January 25th, I attended the Peoria Unified School District's Governing Board meeting. I would like to thank Mr. Savoy, who is the former superintendent designee. He did such a wonderful job. I would also like to say congratulations to Ms. Linda Pallas Thompson on being the new superintendent interim for the Peoria Unified School District. Congratulations to Ms. Monica Seja Martinez as the new Peoria Unified School District's Governing Board President, and congratulations to Ms. Beverly Pingarelli as the new Peoria Unified School District Governing Board Clerk. On Saturday, January 27th, I attended the Farmer's Market at Park West with my family. There were really great vendors out there. My personal favorite was the coffee vendors because I have such a busy schedule to keep track of. Overall, it was such a great event. If you haven't gone, I encourage you to go out on Saturday and check out the Farmer's Market. On Monday, the t on Monday, January 29th, 
I attended a youth group with Nathaniel Washburg at um, Rio Vista, and our youth advisory board members were in attendance as we discussed future plans and possible implementations five years from now for both the main Peoria Public Library and the Sunrise Mountain Library. On Tuesday, January 30th, I attended the library strategic plan, which was very similar to the 29th meeting. We just had a broader range of age group and lots of impressive ideas for the future. I would like to say thank you to Ms. Jill Thompson for the invitation. On Wednesday, January 31st, I attended Cactuses versus Peoria's Idol Rivalry at Cactus High School. The ticket at the door was $5. We then later used our tickets for casting our votes. There were really great singers, and all of them were very talented. <laughs> Lastly, I would like to thank the council and the community for all of your support and continued support for Raymond S. Kellis High School's Special Olympic soccer team for representing the state of Arizona for the 2018 USA Special Olympic Games in Seattle, Washington that's going to happen this year. That's all I have today, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Aren't our youth incredible? Gosh. Um, Julie, I also want to congratulate you. Thank you for everything that you brought to the city of Peoria, um, all the quality and the character and, and the pride that you brought here. And I know that you're going to take that to Goodyear, and I guess that will make us sister cities with Goodyear. <laughs> so we will keep in close contact. And I also want to congratulate uh, two members of our council, Council Member Bill Patena and Council Member John Edwards. They are reaching a five-year milestone and get these wonderful awards <laughs> for you. you. And for you, please pass that down. Thank you for your five years of service. <laughs> and with that, we are adjourned.